The Colossus, attributed to Goya, but nevertheless, it seems to be a painting made by one or many of the disciples of this Aragonese master. It's a dark piece that shows a picture of a calamity and the impact that it has over the insignificant and uncountable people and animals. They try to run from this storm, hopeless, without direction and in utter chaos. If there is something that we can feel from this painting, it's desperation. The Parliament by Monet, an art piece from the master of the technique known as Impressionism. The emphasis on the pastel tones, the amorphous and diffuse silhouette with the background of what appears to be a beautiful sunset. A figure, almost invisible, between the blurriness of the body of water that turns out to be a sailboat. We can feel serenity. A while ago I was at a party with some of my best buddies. The girl from one of my buddies came up to me and we started chatting about what kind of music I like. I told her some bands and genres that I like it and are somewhat popular. I don't remember how, but we changed topics onto things like the understanding of art and what represents art in a philosophical and humanistic sense. I'm of the basic bitch opinion that art is anything, be it a painting, book, sculpture, etc. that was created by someone else and it generates a feeling or a feel in you. There are buildings that create a sense of impotence, comfort, hospitality, and grandeur. There are books that can make you cry, or books that can make you laugh. Same thing with movies, songs, etc. She asked me, what is one of the greatest pieces of art mankind has made? Inside my head, images of statues, musical pieces, paintings, books, marvels of engineering and architecture, movies, and right at the end, video games. I remember my favorite video game, and I said without thinking much, Doom Eternal. The next five minutes were pathetic, since I started trying to explain, in a way that a normal human being could understand, why I think this game is the greatest achievement of art in human history. That made me realize that I need a tool that's more useful for me to get myself through. And I think a review video essay kind of thing would help. So I hope that you enjoyed this pathetic explanation of why Doom Eternal is the best game that exists. Doom Eternal is a sequel to Doom 2016, which was in itself a reboot, or a soft reboot, that is to say a different continuity from the origin original Doom 1 and the original Doom 2, and even Doom 3. If you don't know, Doom 1 and 2 are basically the fathers, or grandfathers by now, of modern first-person shooters like COD and Fortnite. Doom is a series of games created by its software in 1993. The elements that shine the most from these games are the themes of sci-fi combined with diabolical and cosmic horror aspects. Multiple weapons, each helpful for specific situations, fast movement, multiple demons with different attack patterns, great level design, and, well, the edgy and satanic imagery that shows throughout the whole series, which I've always found appealing in a personal way, though it can sometimes be excessive with the gore and the satanic imagery. Doom Eternal came out in 2020 for the PC, PS4, Xbox One, and later had a great port which I haven't played on the Nintendo Switch. Doom Eternal tells the story of a galactic and interdimensional demonic invasion that reaches Earth, and by proxy, humanity. In the events of the last game, Doom 2016, a huge business conglomerate from Earth, known as the Union Aerospace Corporation, or UAC, colonizes Mars and discovers teleportation and interdimensional travel technology. They start using this technology to research the other dim dimensions that they can reach, and they reach a dimension called Argent de Noor. This dimension is very similar to our own, and it was consumed completely by Hell's forces in the past. They discover two things in this dimension. The first is an infinite energy source known as the Argent Energy. It can be harnessed through portals, and the other thing they found is a sarcophagus with manuscripts about a fierce warrior who was simply known by the demons as the Doomslayer. 
After some shit goes awry and some demonic rituals are finalized by some crazy old lady scientist who was surgically attached to basically a nano suit because of some spinal injury or something, the Mars UAC facility is invaded by Hell's forces, almost immediately ending hundreds, even thousands of human lives and putting our entire solar system in danger. The events of Doom 2016 basically take us through Mars, Argentinor, some parts of the demon's dimension, and then back to Mars to go back to hell one more time, kill the mastermind behind the invasion, and return to Mars for some pizza and beer with Dr. Hayden. But, uh-oh, Hayden imprisons us and takes a demonic device that we use to close the portal, known as a crucible, which is made of Argent energy, and he apparently didn't learn shit from the experience and plans to continue using portal technology to aid the UAC's efforts. Or is he? Our time is up. I can't kill you, but I won't have you standing in our way. Until we see each other again. So that's the end of the story for Doom 2016. As you can see, it's nothing to write home about. But it's serviceable for moving you on to the next mission, and one of the crucial things about the story is that the Doomslayer is constantly expressing himself through brutality and violence, which seems to be the answer he uses for everything. There is this level early in the game where you are supposed to deactivate some filters used for refining Argent energy. Hayden is giving instructions on how to dismantle the filters properly and carefully. The Doomslayer then stomps on the filter, destroying it after a few kicks and punches. He throws the monitor away and destroys the PA system after Hayden gives a sorry excuse for an explanation of the situation. Doom 2016 is the embodiment of violence through gameplay. And the story that's told, although basic, is perfect for a video game. Since it gives a lot of opportunities for this layer to express himself either through gameplay or by the use of first person animations during cutscenes. The power fantasy that this game achieves revolutionized and brought to the mainstream once again, and now in full force, what boomer shooters were all about. Fast movement, no reloads, pinpoint accuracy, and extreme violence. This is one of, if not the best reboot to be ever be conceived in gaming. It literally brought this once glorious franchise from the dead. The last proper game for Doom we received was Doom 3 way back in 2004. Literally 12 years had passed and the mechanics of this game landed themselves perfectly and in my opinion this began this, the sudden search of throwback boomer shooters like Dusk and A Medieval which are awesome games in their own right, might even do a video in the future. So with that, we finally reach the story of Doom Eternal. Doom is not a series known by many for its great story or anything. There's this famous quote that has been ran to the ground set by John Carmack, one of the OG IT founders and creator of the Doom engine. Basically, the creator of 3D graphics as we know them in video games. He says something like this. The story in a video game is like story in a porno. You expect it to be there, but it's really not that important. I don't consider myself a Doom lore fanatic or expert or anything, it's pretty easy to get the gist of it. Like Carmack said, it has always been pretty serviceable for what it needs to be. Since the original Doom, there was never much emphasis on the story. It was mainly a way to explain why and where you are fighting demons and move on to the end of the level and on to the next. Doom Eternal takes an approach to its story that I think it's great. It made its story and characters as one note and simple as a Saturday morning cartoon. Now granted, this wouldn't work for every game out there, but I think that series that have not that much stake on their story could benefit from taking this route. If you really care about the story of Doom, especially Doom Eternal, and don't want it spoiled for you, then I suggest that you skip to the time step that's on screen right now, but in reality, there is nothing about the story that will blow you away or anything unspoiled. Thus, the story of Doom Eternal begins with the Doomslayer in his spacefaring gothic fortress watching over Earth and getting ready to go inside a portal that will take him to the heart of the invasion, while cries of help from humanity's remains echo in the radio. From here on, the mission is as simple as it gets. Kill all the demons and stop the invasion. 
So it appears that there are these three hell priests who are the ones responsible for maintaining the portals and thus the demonic invasion. This is done as some sort of ritualistic sacrifice. During the first 10 minutes or so of the game, you get to a hell priest and decapitate him with your own hands. So the next step is to find the other two hell priests and do the same. By the end of the first level, you find the other two priests. For some reason, you don't kill them immediately. They escape and a hologram of what appears to be a cyber gangyo tells you something along the lines that this sacrifice is needed and will not be stopped. So we continue our journey. We go to the dimension of the knights that appear in the first game, Exultia, and we get a power core for our ship. We then travel to the location of the second hell priest, which is in Antarctica for some reason, and this is the next pair of levels that made me realize that Doom Eternal was something really fucking special. But more on that later. We get to the Hell Priest after battling three of his most lethal guardians, the Doom Hunters, and heat his head off. After that, we destroy the biggest gore nest in the world in hopes of delaying the invasion and buying a little more time. We then go to the Resistance Headquarters, which seems to be a splinter branch from the UAC that wished to stop the demonic invasion that the UAC was trying to bring to Earth. The Resistance is known as Ark, and is, or rather, was led by none other than Samuel Hayden, the robot dude immortal scientist who betrayed us at the end of the previous game. He obviously made a fucky walky by bringing portal technology and Argent to Earth, since that was the catalyst for the beginning of the invasion on Earth, and he tried to fix it by establishing Ark. But in the end, they were outnumbered and eventually overpowered by the demons, which in turn led to the events of the game. Samuel Hayden has been neutralized and we need him to discern the location of the final Hell Priest. So we head onto the now almost fully invaded HQ of the Resistance to take Hayden back to our fortress. At the end of the level we have one of the most shit your pants moments of gaming, but we'll get to that later. We take Samuel back to our fortress, set him up, and we get the location of the final Hell Priest, a world or dimension known as Sentinel Prime, that is usually inaccessible and the only way to get to it is by a portal located in the lost city of the dead. Which in turn is located in the core of Mars. And so we get to my favorite level in the game, Mars Core. The goal of this mission is simple, get to the core. But there are no known ways to reach the core. Conveniently, the UAC placed a tiny weapon known as the Big Fucking Gun 10,000, or BFG 10K for short, in one of Mars's moons, Phobos. So, we'll use that little beauty to shoot a hole into the surface of Mars and get to our destination. After all that, we reach the portal and enter Sentinel Prime. We hear the cyborg angels TEDx talk about peace and love and balance while sacrificing billions of lives. And we have some flashbacks to another time way before the events of even the previous games, which explains a little bit about what happened between Doom 2 and Eternal. Basically, and from what I gather, the Doom Slayer comes originally from another dimension. The dimension in which the first two Dooms and Doom 64 happened. In this dimension he fought and repelled the hordes of hell which were invading his dimension's Mars. He couldn't stop the invasion, which reached Earth, killed the Icon of Sin, which was somehow consuming Earth's life force, and then Doom 64 happens. There is another demon planning a full-scale galactic invasion of his dimension, so he goes and kills her and decides to stay in hell killing demons for eternity. Somehow the Doomslayer escaped Hell's Dimension and ended up in Arjun Denur or Exultia or Terra's Nevada, I'm not really sure. He was taken as one of the generals of the army and trained the troops and was generally a well-regarded bro in that dimension. The Con Maker, which is the cyborg angel, decides that the Doomslayer has some great info on these demons and portals he speaks of. And she discovers a way to extract demonic power by creating Arjun. So, it's a little genius how the Doomslayer is the catalyst for all the destruction in his wake. Even the innocents who die could be considered his fault. 
The creation of Origin was made possible by the info he gave to the makers. So really, it's kind of nebulous and paradoxical how it all connects. But it's great when something as simple as this story makes you think a little more like this. Obviously, after gathering the info, the con maker begins her plans to create Argent and ends up causing the invasion of that dimension. Before shit went down and demons fully invaded that dimension in which the Slayer was, however, someone or something gave a gift to the Doomslayer with a device called the God Machine, <laughs> which gave him the superhuman abilities we see in Doom 2016 and Eternal. The Slayer decided again to stay and fight the demonic hordes, and when the demons saw that the Slayer rage was, uh, eternal, they decided to entomb him in the sarcophagus that was eventually found by Hayden at the beginning of Doom 2016. So that's basically the gist of the backstory and lore of Eternal, which is done pretty heavily in Sentinel Prime, but still, I think it's okay since it really doesn't detract from the awesome fight that awaits at the end of the level. So the level ends with the Slayer decapitating the little priest, which is heresy and will be met with deadly force by the armies of Sentinel Prime, since it's holy ground and Sentinel blood cannot be spilled on these grounds. So that's the end of that. The three Hell Priests have been killed and yet the invasion still continues. Turns out we now have to stop the Makers from summoning the Icon of Sin onto Earth, which will basically consume all of Earth's life and render the sacrifice of humanity complete. This is all done so that the con maker and the makers can continue to exist, since there is this deep lore about how the father, who is the creator of all life in the universe, has disappeared and no one knows where he is, and the absence of the father makes it so that the makers cannot clone themselves or continue on living. I don't know, it's kind of weird, but basically the makers created Argent because they needed an infinite energy source to keep on existing. And if I recall correctly, the con maker is somehow dying or her life force is fading slowly. So the makers were planning the full sacrifice of humanity. This is part of the unholy pact between the makers and hell, in which hell consumes earth and the makers refine the earth's life force to give that life force back to the con maker. Since the hell priests are dead, the makers use the backup plan of summoning the icon of sin and consuming earth that way. For us to defeat the Icon of Sin, who is himself a legendary titan reborn by the Makers, we need a rare weapon that we already had but wasn't active anymore. A Crucible, specifically a Crucible Sword. And one of the only known Crucible Swords lies in the ruins of Taras Nabad, a city of great importance for the Sentinels, and one the Slayer had defended previously. The Slayer goes, retrieves the hilt, medallion of power or something, and infuses the sword with Argent to create a super weapon that is a guaranteed one hit kill to any enemy that isn't shielded, including super heavies like the Tyrant and the Archwile. After getting what we need from Taras Nabad, we enter another portal and continue our journey. We now have to get to the Maker Dimension, known as Erdak. But to get to Erdak, we need to use a portal that goes directly there. And the only known one is located in the depths of a city of hell known as Necrobol. This is also one of my favorite levels in the game, both parts. Since it's so big in scale, the devs decided to split the level in two parts. The music is fucking banging, just listen to it. And the aesthetic of the place is just Jesus, look at this. This is one of the coolest depictions of health I've ever seen in my life. Everything is just so cool and evil looking. Fire, lava, dark smoke, suffering, rust, spikes. Everything that you think about when you imagine hell is right here. We see the process of how Argent energy is created. Hayden tells us of a pact that was made between hell and the makers to produce Argent energy using the suffering of souls in hell which is why humanity's sacrifice is needed, and also why the demons are the ones carrying it out. We finally get to the portal that will take us to Ordak and begin the final pair of missions in the game. Ordak is one of the most amazing technical achievements in graphics in any video game ever. The scale of this level is just insane. You sometimes get waypoints that will tell you, oh yeah, your next objective is two kilometers away, good luck. But the place has some incredible jump pads that make the game's most interesting platforming sections. 
We'll go into more detail later once we get into graphics, but this game looks amazing and Erdak is one of the high points in this aspect. The music on the other hand, well, it's really bad. We'll discuss it later when I talk about the soundtrack and the chitstorm around it and Meg Gordon, but the music in this level fucking sucks and it's such a letdown after one of the best tracks in the game. It really makes me not enjoy this level, but whatever. I forgot to mention a kind of important character in the story. The Betrayer. He was someone like the Doomslayer, he broke ties with the Sentinels and now keeps guard over the deaths of Exosia. When we meet him in Exosia, he gave us a dagger and told us to lay him to rest. So this guy has some backstory. His son died during the demonic invasion of Exosia, and that's the reason why he betrayed the Sentinels and turned his back on them. He made a deal with the Makers to bring his son back or save his soul or something, and the Makers of course had their way with him and used the Betrayer's son's soul as a vessel for summoning the Icon of Sin. When we reach the summoning altar on which the Makers are doing the ritual to infuse the soul of the Betrayer's son into the Icon of Sin, this was, in part, to control the Icon of Sin during the final stages of Earth's invasion. The Doomslayer proceeds to use the dagger that the Betrayer gave him to stab what seems to be the essence of the soul of the Betrayer's son. The Icon of Sin then activates on its own and proceeds to open a portal to Earth which then closes and leaves the Slayer stuck in Erdak. So, now our objective is to somehow open a portal to Earth and defeat the Icon of Sin to stop the Earth's invasion. We try to activate a portal using Erdak's technology and using our trusty AI companion Vega who, oh, remember how I said that the father was missing? Well, just before fusing with Erdak's tech, Vega becomes sentient and realizes he was a father all along, and was taken and imprisoned as an AI by Dr. Hayden. What an asshole this Sam. Before we jump into the portal to Earth, the con maker makes a last stand to stop us. Dies, and we hear a voice coming from the heavens yelling, We reach Earth, where the invasion has reached its climax. The Icon of Sin is rampaging through the city, buildings and entire blocks lie in ruins, and demons roam the whole of Earth. We venture forth through a gantlet of the most intense and difficult encounters the base game has to offer, aside from the master levels, and we finally reach the Icon of Sin. I don't think the fight's that hard, but I do think it's cheap as fuck. Particularly the second phase with the comets and the terrain negating fire. Fuck that. You shoot each body part of the Icon of Sin. A total of eight. You do this two times and the fight and the game ends. With you walking and leaving the impressive carcass of the Icon of Sin behind you. Ready for the next step in this unending mission. So that's it for Eternal Story. I want it to be as concise and quick as possible about it, but it's not like nothing happens during the game's events. Of course, Eternal had two story DLCs that expanded the events after the ending of the game, The Ancient Gods Part 1 and 2. They'll have their dedicated section where I'll discuss the story and the additions to the gameplay they brought. Also, some of you more knowledgeable of the lore of Doom might have noticed that I skipped large chunks of the story. Well. This is because I didn't start a fresh safe to capture the parts that happen in the Fortress of Doom, like when the con maker turns the power off our ship and we use the crucible and the last of its energy to power the fortress up and continue kicking ass. Those parts, though cool, don't add a lot to the big picture and can be skipped and use the events of the levels as an example. I even think that the Fortress of Doom was a pretty unnecessary addition to the game. It breaks the pacing between levels. 
and I prefer to have the option of just turning the game off and take a break rather than having to spend 5 to 10 minutes watching time wasting animations every few levels to get upgrades that you also get during the main gameplay. They could have easily increased the number of upgrades scattered in each level or at least give us the option to skip the trips to the fortress and replace it with a menu that uses the sentinel batteries that we gather in the campaign. I get that during the first playthrough it's pretty dope to be able to walk in here, but being forced to spend time on it really detracts me from deleting my save and starting the game over. I only do it once in a while, because the progression system in this game is perfect, save for the fact that it is tied unnecessarily to the trips back to the fortress, but I digress. Sorry for the tangent. Next up. Since their inception, id Software has always been an industry leader in performance, graphics, engine creation, optimization, etc. Doom was no exception, creating some of the first examples of 3D graphics in computers. Granted, there were games before that that used the first person perspective and rough 3D to portray its world, but none did it the way Doom did, and especially considering the engine that ran the thing back then. It was, and still is, a wonder of programming. To this day, people make hundreds if not thousands of mod for this engine specifically, be it full campaigns, maps, or even whole other games inside the engine. Few engines have endured the test of time as much as the Doom engine has, and the only others from that era that could be considered as influential came from it, such as the Quake 1, 2, and 3 engines, and even now, the latest iterations of it tech were, if I recall correctly, the basis for the Vulkan API and were notoriously used for games such as Prey 2017 or The Evil Within 2. Doom Eternal takes the impressive graphics seen in Doom 2016 and cranks it up to 11. I don't think I've ever seen a more colorful game. The amount of detail placed into each texture, each object in the world, even the blood splatters that accumulate on the floor are painstakingly realistic. The insights of your enemies as you tear their flesh apart are beautifully rendered. The demonic invasion that produces tentacles of gore that extend and infest the walls, floors and ceilings. The flaming backdrop of an scorched earth as a colossal demon roams the horizon. The scared and angry faces of the demons as you impale them with your arm blade. The subtle details and animation of each weapon as you tear through the demonic hordes. I could go on for days on everything that this game does right with its presentation and graphics, but let's get right down to business. Doom Eternal runs on the latest iteration of it tech which I think is 7, and snipped a lot of particularities of the engine that made sense way back when, but now they're more or less obsolete. Like the usage of mega textures, which were textures that covered hundreds of meters of the 3D space that made the implementation of large maps and the streaming of large assets possible in older hardware. Doom Eternal also uses, natively, what I think is one of the greatest achievements in technical engineering, which is the Vulkan API. Basically, an API is the bridge that communicates your graphics card to all the other components of the PC, especially the CPU. This is so that the other components work in tandem with the graphics card to render the world in a more optimized way. DirectX is an example of another API, and DX12 took a lot of notes from what Vulkan did back when it was released in 2016. Also for Doom, ironically. In Doom 2016, you could change the API from Vulkan to OpenGL. The game actually launched without Vulkan support, which was added a few months down the line. I remember clearly the difference when I changed the API for the first time. I had a far weaker GPU back then and was playing at 720p and reaching low 50s, high 40s frame rate wise. Once I turned Vulkan on, I ran the game on 1080p, medium settings, consistently reaching 60 frames per second. It was really a game changer, and to this day I'm always hyped for any game that launches with Vulkan, since it almost always means great performance on almost any system. Doom Eternal's art direction is what makes it great in my opinion. Even if the graphics were blurrier or they weren't as detailed as they are now, the game would look great based on the art direction alone. Look at the games from the SNES era. Think something like Mega Man X or Contra. You could easily sit down and play it and not be distracted by the graphics. Since those, games, since, <laughs> since those games had some great artists that work on making the characters, enemies and environments be as memorable, fun, cool
cool and recognizable as possible. But play a game like Mortal Kombat 2, which was a leap in technology at the time, using digitized graphics of real people to play as characters in the game. The game looks very crude, old and crusty in my opinion, because the boundaries that they were trying to push were just not there yet. Though the game can be a lot of fun, and the art direction has its heart in the right place, it's just not as memorable in my eyes, like something like Castlevania 4 or Kirby Superstar, which had awesome artists and designers behind them that used the limitations of the system to create their world. Which then brings us back to Doom Eternal, with its perfect art direction. I don't even need to tell you that you can recognize demons based on their shape, since the invisible demons known as Spectre variants that you sometimes fight are great examples of this god tier art direction. There's just no confusing a pinky with a griplish, or an imp with a prowler. I don't really know what else to say about the graphics, I think they more than speak for themselves, but the art direction does deserve a lot of praise, since it emboldens the graphics even more and will make the game timeless. This game will still look great because of its art direction, rather than its graphics 10 years down the line. Also, Doom Eternal has some of the most varied environments throughout the game that I've experienced in any game. Though motives like the gore tentacle invasion or the slick metallic surfaces of UAC installations are used many times throughout the game, most of the environments that you go through the game are tailor-made for that specific level. You go from a flaming city in ruins with demons crawling in every corner then to a paradisical, dystopic, forgotten land of ancient warriors that has been consumed by hell. To, finally, a snowy mechanical nightmare of a facility that creates amalgamations of demons and tanks in the first four levels of the game. And it just gets crazier from there. It's amazing to see a game achieve this level of what I can only describe as 90s gaminess and seamlessly combine the design of a legendary classic franchise such as Doom with modern graphics and mechanics. Doom is Doom. Whether it's eternal or an early entry in the franchise, this series has achieved iconic status. And Eternal is a cherry on top of the foundational allegorical cake that is Doom. The Doom series has always been known for its great metal soundtrack. The first game had many renditions of its soundtrack, which was in turn mainly composed of riffs and musical motifs that were popular in the metal world at the time. Great, memorable and cohesive. The controversy of the soundtrack is as follows, and I won't delve much into it since it doesn't hamper what is already on there. And in the end, Holschild and Levi, who had been fan favorites to continue, got the job for the DLCs. So everything's fine in the end. The only problem is someone acted like a goddamn diva. And to this day, the official OST is nowhere to be found or bought, except for the few people who got the chance to buy the collector's edition, which I think was $200 at the time of release. So if you want to get these songs on your playlist, the only way is through the eye patch way, which is how I'm putting some of this stuff here. The story goes that during the development of Eternal, it approached Gordon to produce the soundtrack again, on which he agreed. Since he had already worked on the soundtrack for Doom 2016, he received the down payment to start working on the OST and produce the songs that ended up in the game, such as Hell on Earth, Super Gorness. The only thing they fear is you. Its software had paid for a specific number of songs to be written for the game based on how many levels it would have. But when the deadline for the game was nearing, 
it approached Mick Gordon again to ask about the remaining songs, to which Gordon asked for more time. There are rumors that some of the final delays of the game, which was supposed to come out at the end of 2019 if I'm not mistaken, and ended up coming out in early 2020, were caused by the failure to deliver from Gordon. Its software continued to ask for the rest of the OST, but when the final deadline was almost there, they decided to put one of the sound engineers to produce some quick tracks, Ordek and some of the ambient tracks which sound weird or out of place during the game are most likely caused by this, and it really is a shame that it ended up the way it did, especially the fact that there is just no way to get the OST. But nevertheless, the OST we got in the end is fantastic. Probably the best OST that has ever been produced for a game, really. No symphonic orchestra could ever achieve the levels of hype this OST reaches in its best parts. Game designers and directors have the tough job of bringing a specific experience they have imagined to life through obscure magics. There's a magical smoke that makes your PC work. And if that same magic smoke should escape any component of your PC, then that component would lose its magical powers and wouldn't work anymore. Well, game developers are basically wizards and warlocks that manipulate this magical smoke inside your expensive magical artifacts like the GPU, RAM and CPU to create what you see in the game through some voodoo high fantasy hidden eldritch rituals known as programming, which I know nothing about since I know some people that delved into that hidden truth of the universe and became insane. So I'm obviously scared of anything that has to do with that. The point of this tangent is that there are some times when technology reaches a new height, a new milestone that sets the precedent for something great and leads to a turning point in art itself. This is when great artists achieve greatness, when the stars align and everything is set to build a masterpiece from the ground up that will determine what people in the future will take for inspiration. Michelangelo said, every block of stone has a statue inside it and it is the task of the sculptor to discover it. I saw the angel in the marble and carved it until I set him free. If we take these words for a fact, then we have to assume something about the author of any work of art. The author context and contemporary circumstances dictate the design decisions of their works of art. Their legacy contains within it the legacy of hundreds or thousands of other authors, as in it, it contains the compounded knowledge and mastery of the craft. As the saying goes, there's nothing new under the sun, but it is the combination of each individual part which makes art what it is. Intentional or not, patterns form, and incredible ideas are born or assimilated. So let me go to my damn point then. Doom 2016 used background music, as with almost every part of their game, in tandem with all the other mechanics in the game. Once Vegas core is destroyed, the vacuum of energy will pull you back. Doom 2016 was rougher, as the others surely didn't have much time for quality assurance and making the gameplay work was more important than the dynamic music system that they implemented. A dynamic music system is simple in concept but can be expanded greatly. It could be said that all games feature dynamic music in some way, since music is almost always used to set the mood in the game, working in conjunction with the graphics and the gameplay, obviously. But dynamic music is that which reacts to whatever the player is doing or experiencing. One simple example is the drowning music in Sonic. It's supposed to create tension during a stressful moment in which your character is about to suffer one of the most horrible fates a living being can experience. Dying of asphyxiation. Holy shit, that word is hard. The music in the game reacts to the character's imminent death. 
The gameplay provides the opportunity for this to happen, and the game is clear on what constitutes a fail state and is stating through the music and the counter that you're about to kick the puppy. The music dynamically adapts, albeit in a very crude way, to what is happening in the game, to make this idea more concise. Another great example would be the hurry up change in tempo once the timer in Super Mario Bros. games hits under 100. That's just adapting the same song to the events in game. As you can see, this technique has been around for more than 30 years at least now. So how does Doom Eternal treat the dynamic music concept? Well, as you can see, the game adapts whatever the player is doing to what the music is doing. Sometimes this will be a specific part of one of the many songs that comprise each level playing in the background while you explore. I'm serious, that guy doesn't scare me. I'd like to see him try. <laughs> setting an ambience and mood to the level. Once you enter a combat arena, the music changes completely to one of the battle themes for that level. The music during combat changes dynamically in a non-intrusive way. One of the ways it does this is amp up the rhythm and regularly add layers to the song being played once combat gets more hectic. For example, more demons spawn in. The layers and layers of deafening hardcore music and the cacophony of noise from the demons and your weapons that pile up during the more combat-heavy levels can be described as artistic. We loop back around to what I was talking about during the intro of the video. Video games are art. Some of them achieve this through mere sentimentalism or surreal imagery and mechanics. But Doom Eternal combines every aspect of almost every influential game since the early 90s into one huge game. And the dynamic music is one aspect of the game that makes it stand out as an artistic piece more than anything. Friends of mine are involved in the music industry, and they've told me personally that this game's music is the best soundtrack of any game in history, since, again, it's an evolution and subversion of how complex and creative music and sound design can be in a game. So finally, let's talk about the music in the game. My favorite level is Mars Core, as stated in the story section, but the music of this level is a high-octane, electronically searing melody combined with group metal riffs that pumps up your blood pressure up to get you to a frantic battle during the peak of the song. Each level of the game is like a song in a metal album, with different verses, bridges and choruses. And even though each level is comprised of multiple songs, they all fit together to form a cohesive atmosphere and theme for each level. Even the few songs that get repeated, like Meat Hook, or Hell on Earth. Probably the most popular song in the game is The Only Thing They Fear Is You. Yes, that's the name of the song.
which is the song that plays during one of the also most popular and fan favorite level of the game, Art Complex. This song has a groove to it that makes you headbang without you noticing it. It's noisy, it's chaotic, but it's also full of that violence inducing combination of metal and industrial and synth. The song has a lot of highs and lows to accentuate and attenuate different scenarios during the mission, but the parts when the main riff kicks in and the gameplay is at its climax are just some of the best gaming bliss moments in my memory. Of course, there is also the black cheap of the bunch, Erdak, which is a set of songs that I really despise, and every time I get to this level, I sigh in disbelief that I will have to listen to the moans and nonsensical electronic thumping of some sound engineer who has no idea what he's doing but he has three days to create songs for this level. It's a shame that Gordon didn't do the whole soundtrack like he did in 2016, which had a lot more cohesion in its OST than Eternal has, especially once you factor in the DLCs and their soundtracks. Another aspect that I think deserves a lot of praise from Eternal is its sound design. During my first playthrough, I found the sound design and some of the choices to be kind of weird and over the top. For example, listen to the sound that occurs when placing a headshot. And listen to the sound of a weak point being broken. The alert sound when running low on ammo for the equipped weapon. And other sound effects that fill the game. I didn't find them annoying, I just found them kind of distracting, but after some time playing, during my second playthrough which was in Nightmare, I noticed why the sound was this way. A lot of classic games use exaggerated noises that work as what are regularly known in fighting games as hit confirms. The simplest example of a hit confirm can be found in Call of Duty games, but also in Doom Eternal though they are an evolution from this concept, they are used very seamlessly in this game. But the exaggerated sound confirmation of a headshot is one really well done concept in this game. It may sound distracting, but you'll be pretty grateful once you begin quick switching weapons and have to use your ears more than your eyes to make the most of the opportunities during combat. Sound design in any action game is key to be able to tell a lot of what's happening on the battlefield just by sound alone. The confirmation of a weak point being destroyed is almost a necessity during the more chaotic fights. The low ammo ping resonates and stands out a lot from other sounds in the game, so this makes you instantly aware of the danger that running out of bullets is nearby. Every choice in this game is deliberate to make it easier for you to adapt and use every one of your senses to survive the sound design is only one aspect of it. This serves as a great segue to the next aspect that makes Eternal a real and unique piece of art. The original Doom and Doom 2 had some awesome combat and gameplay. Mainly, it consisted of you traversing through a maze-like environment, looking for a way forward. Occasionally, requiring keycards of different colors to open doors of the corresponding color. Of course, during this exploration you'll come across rooms filled with demons, traps and hazards that will hamper your journey through Mars, Hell and Earth. The games had guns that became staples of the first-person shooter genre, like the pistol for measly damage with a good range and good accuracy, the shotgun for up-close encounters with demons or demons that want to take a bite out of you to the plasma rifle and the chain gun, to keep demons in place through a barrage of damaging bullets or blue scorching plasma balls. Each demon served a different purpose, from the imps shooting long-range projectiles to the zombies shooting a heat-scanning weapon across insufferable distances, but not taking too much punishment before going down, to the Baron of Hell, who works as a tank and one of the highest damage dealers in the game. You will rarely encounter more than a few of them, but when they are in groups, ooh boy. 
So, the original two dooms expected you to be a good explorer to find secret keycards needed to progress and items to heal, deal damage, or protect you from more damage. Have a good sense of three-dimensional direction, have quick reflexes to avoid damage, and to choose the best gun for the moment, and that basically was the gameplay loop in Doom back then. As with the story, but I think way more important, the gameplay loop of Eternal and the little secrets that you can discover as you get good at the game is part of the whole Doom Eternal experience. So if you have any intentions of playing the game, then I recommend you skip this section. It's a rather large section of the video, and I want to focus on the multiple things the game does with its gameplay and get down to the grid of the gameplay with useful combos and even tips. So watch the next section at your own discretion. If you want some tips on the game before you go yourself and play it and make your experience with the game and the first run a little less frustrating, then I do suggest watching this entire section as some of the most punishing aspects of the game hit hard and knowing them beforehand, as stated earlier, is part of the learning curve for this game. So, depending on how hardcore you want your first experience with the game to be, it's your choice whether to skip this to the timestamp or to keep watching. Let me show you something disturbing and worrying about me. This is the number of hours I spent playing Eternal. Even if you say, oh, you could be idling in the menus or AFK for a lot of the time, let's exaggerate and say that 100 hours of that time were spent in the game and they were AFK. That still leaves us with over 500 hours of effective game time. I'm obsessed with this game. Its release is almost two years in the past now, and I'm still not exhausted by it. I'm still finding new ways to play and experimenting with my playstyle. As you can see during some gameplay sections, I'm using the microwave beam and the full auto shotgun a lot. Both mods I tended to not use since I found more DPS and less situational uses for them. So if you force yourself to use different tactics, you'll be forcing yourself into the situations that make the most of the weapons. This game is the epitome of replayability, and though it's not for everyone, I hope you can trust me with explaining and analyzing thoroughly this amazing game. I liken Doom Eternal a lot to fighting games, where you will have a lot of fun learning a character that catches your eye without looking at a guide, and after you feel you've mastered the character on your own, you look for guides. And you discover that, while you were not wrong in the way you learned the character, there was a lot of secret technique that only a person with deeper knowledge on the game can know. So you then adapt your playstyle to maximize the efficiency of your character. Well, Doom Eternal feels something like that. Or if you've ever played something like Devil May Cry or Bayonetta, you'll know the feeling of totally dominating your enemies with flashy combos and doing the most difficult tech that can lead to some pretty rewarding experience. If you have already learned the game in and out, then maybe you can give me some feedback on what I may be doing inefficiently with my combat, based on the gameplay I show and the combos I try to show. The Doom Eternal community as a whole is awesome. Rarely have I encountered toxicity anywhere, and I'm sure at least some of you guys are watching. When we get to battle mode, who knows, maybe you'll recognize my username, since I have played my fair share of battle mode. I'm not very good at it. But I've had had some great rounds and the gameplay loop from the campaign translates beautifully into this inventive and original multiplayer mode. Forgive me for saying this like a thousand times in the video, but... You better save that shit as a .FLA later, cause we got a ship to sink! The gameplay of Doom Eternal is genius, as it took its base from what Doom 2016 laid down and improved upon it substantially. Basically, Doom 2016 was a modern reimagining of the original Doom 1 and 2, bringing the story of this layer back to the mainstream consciousness with a buffed combat system when comparing the two. The combat system featured a mechanic that changed the outlook on FPS and games in general for me and a lot of gamers out there. As games became more casual and game developers hoped to broaden their audiences, the decline of the classic FPS took place during the turn of the century. The mid-2000s were filled with modern shooters, based purely on quick reflexes and aim, with regenerating health, cover mechanics, and a general sense of castrating the player's choices in order to make the game more accessible to everyone. For example, in the first Doom, there were tense moments driven entirely by gameplay. Let's say having 30% health and no armor, with only 10 shotgun shells and some ammo for the chain gun. You've just had a close encounter with a pinky, 
You've used a lot of ammo and unfortunately you get cornered and lost your armor. There's a red door. You already have the key card, but you can hear some enemies are behind the door. Since you're playing on ultra violence, chances are you have already exhausted most resources in the level and you don't know. You could open the door and see only two zombies and an imp back there with some health and items on the side. But you could also open the door to an army of soldiers, pinkies and barons that would eat your remaining health in a matter of milliseconds. You have to open the door eventually, but you can feel the pressure building up. You decide right now, I'ma do it. You open the door and there's nothing. The demons are on another part of the level. So you take a deep breath and a sigh of relief as you enter the room. Only to be blindsided by an imp that you could hear but you swore he was in another room. He takes away 14% of your health with that fireball and you run like hell. Literally screaming IRL like a little girl once you hear the alerted grunts of the other demons. In Call of Duty all this wouldn't tell is you having to run and take cover for 5 seconds before health regen kicks in. Doom 2016 chose another approach to this situation and I think it's amazing. You have your resources which are health, armor and ammo. Health is the most important of the bunch, since if you run out of health, obviously it's game over. But armor prevents damage to your health, though it's harder to come by, and ammo in 2016 is basically everywhere. You'll rarely, if ever, run out of ammo. But how do you recover health, you ask? Well, easy. By staggering a demon and pressing the use key when they're flashing orange, you can proceed with an insta-kill animation that sees the slayer ripping, tearing and destroying the demons in brutal ways that are just... Oh. This is called a glory kill. And when you glory kill an enemy, they drop a bunch of resources. In 2016, if I recall correctly, they drop whatever you needed at the moment. For example, if you were low on health, they would drop small health pickups. Of course, by the end of the game, you'd have seen the same animations at least 10 times around, but they are so quick and the satisfaction of regaining health while keeping your killing streak is incomparable. There are also a lot of comparisons that can be made to God of War, but I'll let Mayo do that comparison. But one of the first games that I saw implement a mechanic similar to Glory Kill was, in fact, God of War. It really is a thing of beauty and really pushes the idea that if you want to survive, you must kill every demon in your way. The way that this combat loop has been described is with a lot of different names, for example push combat or active health regeneration mechanics. Hugo Martin, the wholesome herbal, the creative director for the game, says that this is the fun zone. When you fully grip the mechanics that revolve around your resources to stay alive and push you to be as aggressive as possible, since that is the most effective way to recover said resources. That is the fun zone. Doom Eternal saw this system and said So you have the basics of Doom 2016, do a glory kill to recover resources. Though you will now notice that the enemy only ever drops health when you do a glory kill. And also, instead of having 30 shells for the shotgun, you start the game with only 16 shells and by the end of the game you'll have 24 instead of the 60 in Doom 2016. Enemies are much more aggressive this time around and will not hesitate to stun luck you if they have the chance. So you recuperate health with a glory kill. But how about ammo? Well, there's pickups, but they are few and far between. So that's where the chainsaw comes in. In Doom 2016 you had the option to use the chainsaw as a quick kill that was guaranteed to drop ammo. But in Eternal, the chainsaw is an essential part of the combat loop since it's the way you recover ammo during combat and it now works a lot differently than in 2016. In 2016 the chainsaw worked more or less like a gun that you pull out and use on the enemy that you're aiming at but in Eternal it works more like an item that you press a key to use at the moment you need it. When running low on ammo the game will tell you with a noticeable sound and you must choose to either change weapons and tactics or look for a demon you can chainsaw to get some ammo. On the other hand, the chainsaw only works on some demons, specifically father demons like imps, gargoyles and zombies. If you want to kill a bigger demon, like a mancubus or a revenant, you would need 3 charges, which is the max of the chainsaw, to kill that one demon. It is a good option to have if you find yourself cornered by heavy demons, but generally I'd avoid using the chainsaw as a weapon for heavy demons, since chainsaw fuel can be hard to come by. But don't worry though, one charge of the chainsaw is always on cooldown once you use the last charge or the three charges. I always like to carry two charges for the chainsaw, since it can be used as an escape tool in tight spaces where there are other demons nearby. Oh, you are also invulnerable during any glory kill 
and chain towing enemies counts as a glory kill in vulnerability wise. Also, you cannot chainsaw super heavy demons like Barons of Hell or Tyrants. And finally, you have your armor, which, as stated earlier, serves as a full buffer for your health. Armor tops at the end of the game at 150 and held at 200, though the later demons can take all your armor with a single attack. Fucking archpile. To recover your armor, you use one of the new abilities that the Slayer acquires, which is the Flame Belch. The Slayer's power armor now has a blade, which is used in a lot of glorious glory kills, and a mechanical device strapped to his shoulder, which serves as both a grenade launcher and a flamethrower. The grenade is used as an enemy staggerer, this way, you can approach heavily defensive demons like the Mancubus, but the Flame Belch is used to, you guessed it, light enemies on fire. I don't know exactly how this shit works, but apparently the Slayer can turn burnt demon flesh into armor. Yes, burning enemies and shooting them grants you armor points. So, it's always a good idea to approach a large group of enemies and use the Flame Belch to get a shitload of armor and always have your health as protected as possible. As you can see, it's a pretty neat triangle of resources that you have to manage to successfully survive the adventure. Doom Eternal expects the player to be intelligent with your management of health, ammo and armor, since encounters can turn deadly in a matter of milliseconds. Though the game can at times feel cheap, the game is pretty generous and gives you a lot of opportunities to get by. For example, the game will almost always leave you on the brink of death instead of killing you if you receive a deadly strike, leaving you with only 5 health. And this is your cue to either glory kill anything near you, or get the fuck out of there and look for a father demon to glory kill. Exploiting large groups of enemies with grenades and the flame belch also becomes second nature. The Slayer also acquires a blood punch during the game. This is a single use punch, though it can later have two charges, that staggers enemies and highly damages any demon in front of you. The way you recharge it is by charging up a meter on the left side by doing glory kills. Two glory kills net you a blood punch, but by the end of the game, a single glory kill on a heavy demon grants you a full charge, and it also gets charged with the overflow of health and armor if you have it topped off. The Slayer also gets an Ice Bomb, which freezes demons in place for a few seconds. It can be highly upgraded to even give health when damaging frozen demons. For movement, the Slayer has a double jump and a two charge dash. The dash is both used in combat and in platforming, and it's a great addition to the Slayer movements. The dash actually breaks 2016 for me. I really can't go back to that game. It's just too slow for me now. The Slayer can now climb up certain walls and he also mantles over them. Getting near a ledge can get you over a wall or an obstacle. The dash and the grenade and the ice bomb and the chainsaw all work on cooldowns. Only the blood punch requires active charging. So that's it for abilities. Other than mantling, pole swings and other platforming elements, the Slayer's basic moveset, as you can see, is pretty extensive. Something that Doom Eternal does very well is introduce its mechanics progressively and through, well, character progression. That is to say, on your first run, during the first level and about a third of the second level, you won't even have the dash yet. But by the beginning of the fifth mission, you already have all your weapons, except the BFG and the Crucible Sword. And you have all your abilities like grenades, flame belch, dash and blood punch unlocked. The character progression adds a lot of replayability and for sadistic fox like me, we have to optimize our character build from the beginning, with which runes, mods and upgrades we choose in our Ultra Nightmare runs. Ultra Nightmare is the hardest challenge in the game, it's the highest difficulty setting with permadeath. If you die once, the game deletes your fucking save file and you have to start over from the beginning of the game. That was a challenge I never thought possible to achieve, but through luck, skill and stubbornness it can be overcome. Now that we're on the topic, let's talk about difficulty. Doom 2016 was an okay game, difficulty wise. Nightmare was hard, but not excessively hard, considering the super shotgun was the only weapon that you needed to get through the whole game. But Eternal says, fuck that shit, here comes the pain baby! Eternal knows its difficulty is through the roof. So, as it's tradition with the series, the game implements multiple levels of difficulty that can range from easy to very fucking hard. This does not change the encounters, but rather the damage output and speed of enemies. I feel that if you consider yourself a proficient FPS player, then ultra violence is the way to go. Some parts may frustrate you, especially during your first run, but if you pull through and keep it together, it's one of the most rewarding and jaw-droppingly awesome experience you'll have in your life.
Before I get into the weapons, I need to talk a little about the combat in Doom Eternal. In my opinion, I think the combat is best experienced by not knowing anything about the game. I'll talk about that mentality later, but for now, here's another spoiler warning for the mechanics of the game. I really hope that everyone who plays this game for the first time has an experience that they will never forget. And having some of these mechanics spoiled really serves as a detriment to the overall experience of the game. Regardless, I'll give an explanation of the gameplay and combat loop of the game. If you really want to experience it for yourself, then follow the timestamp that I placed earlier. But I also feel I need to explain the mechanics of the game for people that would normally give up easily on the difficulty spikes. So whatever your decision you take, that was your gameplay spoilers. The combat is what is known as a boomer shooter. Basically, it thrives on the high speed and high mobility of your character. But the enemies are no slouches either. There are multiple types of demons, and the game categorizes them as father, heavy, super heavy demons, and bosses. But they each have a role in the battle loop, regardless of the weight class. For example, zombie soldiers and imps serve as the main infantry of Hell's forces. They usually don't charge into combat, but rather maintain distance and strafe while constantly letting out pot shots and fireballs that don't do much damage. But a big group of these guys can easily mean problems, particularly in tight spaces. Most of the times you use these demons as fodder for your chainsaw when you're running low on ammo, and they can be found in most combat encounters. The heavies are the most buried of the bunch. They have high mobility melee warriors like the Hell Knight, long range talkers like the Revenant, high mobility harassers like the Prowler, and high damage high mobility dynamic demons like the Whiplash, which will use long range chain attacks or close range slashes that can quickly take off all of your health if you're not paying attention. The Cyber Mancubus is my most hated guy of this bunch, since he does high damage, has armor and takes a ton of damage. He also has a long range AoE attack that leaves acid on the floor which does high damage and a close range AoE that can insta kill you if you're not careful during your approach. Super heavy demons are interesting enough though not as buried as the other categories. Their designs and their appearance during battle surely puts a lot of pressure on you. The Baron of Hell is basically a Hell Knight on steroids. He's three times the size of a Hell Knight and has long range as well as close range attacks. I've also noticed that they have some pretty complex AI. They tend to flank you and retreat from combat when it suits them and they are always looking for an approach to get the upper hand either by surprise flanking attack or by taking a different approach when you're comboing their ass. The Marauder is the most interesting of this type of demon, but I want to dedicate some section to the Marauder, since it was a point where many people or uh, the scrubs dropped the game. The Marauder is an evolution of the holy shit enemy you encounter in classic game, like the first time a fiend jumps at you in the first episode of Quake. Some demons have weak points that can be shot and then they explode, causing the demon to falter. The weak points in some demons also deny some abilities. For example, taking the turret out of an Aragna turn will make him unable to shoot long range projectiles, only leaving him with melee attacks and mid range grenades. The Cyber Mancubus is a bitch, for example, because he has no weak points and has armor, so you cannot deny DPS and you have to get up close with the risk of his AoE attack going off and killing you. I love it. Demons in Doom Eternal have some vulnerable states that can be achieved by using certain weapons. I already mentioned that demons can get into a staggered, dazed or faltered state, but let me be clear on the difference between these states. A staggered state is achieved when a demon receives enough damage to be glory killed. They glow orange and are stunned in place for a specific amount of time. The Revenant takes ages to recover, but the Archvile and the Doomhunter are a pain in the urethra because they tend to break out of the stagger before you can reach them. A dazed demon was a state that originally was just a sustained falter. But in the second DLC, they added an exaggerated sound effect and some cartoonish stars over the day's demon's head. The most commonly dazed enemy is the Marauder. I think he's the only one in the base game that can achieve this state. Finally, faltering demons is key to getting into advanced combos and techniques for combat. A falter occurs when an explosion or enough damage is done to an enemy to trigger a short animation in which they are stunned for about a second. This can be taken advantage of for you to get close and do some devastating damage with a super shotgun or a full auto barrage. This is a necessity for the Cyber Mancubi, as stated earlier. So, as you can see, this game expects a lot of you. 
just by remembering each demon, their behavior, and how to deal with them. But that's not all. Jesus Christ, no, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We're going full iceberg analysis on this. Let's move along. The weapons in Doom Eternal are your main form of interaction with the demons. Every weapon has two weapon mods, except for the super shotgun, which works as an alternate fire mode, and each weapon is useful for different scenarios. For example, you don't want to shoot a rocket when facing a wall, since the splash damage will fuck you up a little, and you don't want to use something like the full auto on a mid-range or long-range encounter with a revenant or whiplash. Most of your shots will miss, and you'll be wasting precious ammo. The first weapon is the combat shotgun, a single barrel pump action shotgun with decent range and decent power, able to take out a zombie soldier in two close range shots and an imp in one shot. This weapon basically dictates your playstyle. Believe it or not, I've never been quite good with aiming, not even with mouse and keyboard. I tense up when I need to be precise and my wrist cramps up and I usually fuck up my shots because of it. But Eternal gives you a lot of freedom. If you have bad aiming or you are pretty good with it, there's an option for you. And these options are called weapon mods. The shotgun has the sticky grenade or the full auto mod. The sticky grenade shoots out a time explosive that sticks to any surface, be it an enemy, a wall or a floor. This is your option if you're like me and you suck at aiming. The explosion has decent splash damage and usually staggers smaller enemies. It can also be used to snipe weak points on enemies. Full auto makes your shotgun burn through ammo and it deals a crazy amount of DPS to unsuspecting demons. It slows you down a little bit and the range is atrocious, but it's a great combo finisher. The second weapon is the heavy cannon, which is basically an assault rifle. The standard shot is laughably bad, only useful against zombies and imps, and barely at that. But the gun has one of the most important mods in the game, and even if you're bad with it at first, you'll learn to love the destruction the precision bolt brings to the table. It zooms in on a scope on the cannon to snipe enemies from a distance and it uses up 6 bullets. It is a guaranteed headshot kill to any father demon. The best use for this weapon is for sniping weak points, which can save your ass. The other mod is pretty useful, though much more situational. It is a micro missiles. We shoot out a barrage of tiny missiles that stick to the enemy and do a lot more damage than a normal round. By the end of the game there's an upgrade for it that makes it do like 2 times more damage for a while after you kill an enemy with the normal rounds. Very useful against bosses and super heavies. It melts through the toughest enemies but drains ammo fast. The third weapon is the plasma rifle, which shoots out scorching balls of plasma at the enemy. Highly accurate and damaging. This weapon is one of my least used weapons, but its utility is pretty high. One mod bends out energy in a blast around you, highly damaging and faltering demons around you. It will also destroy weak points. The other mod is the microwave beam, which shoots out a ray that stuns an enemy in place. It shows you a health bar of the enemy and slowly damages the enemy. On the flip side, it makes you slow down to a crawl and it takes a while to kill anything other than an imp, but it can be used to set up combos or stop an incoming attack from a big enemy. The microwave beam becomes a very important part of your arsenal since it stuns enemies in place and shows you how much health they have left. It's an excellent escape option for tough fights where super heavies or heavies are surrounding you and you need a breather to get your bearings by stunning demons. There's also the hot dog combo, I'll tell you about it when I talk about them or other. The fourth weapon surprisingly is the rocket launcher, which is a mix of a power weapon and a utility weapon, as the lock on burst mod shoots out three rockets that hum in and locked on targets. This is great for taking out pesky demons, slim and fast enemies like the prowler or the whiplash. Then there's the remote detonation, which lets you explode a missile in mid-air with the right mouse button. Once fully upgraded, it's a guaranteed falter on almost any enemy, so it's a great choice for utility since it can stagger a group of enemies and open up a path if you find yourself cornered. I also use it as a way to save grenades when encountering cybermancubi, since you need to falter them before getting close or they will use their AOE close range attack that can turn the tables on you pretty quick. The fifth weapon is the super shotgun. This is a staple of the series, having its humble beginnings in Doom 2. Doom 2 Super Shotgun remains one of the greats in the whole FPS genre. It's just the right amount of powerful and slow. It's not overpowered, but it can be used in almost any situation. It's efficient, quick, and most of all, reliable. 
The clicking sounds of the reload, it's something that's burned into our brains for anyone who played it back in the day. It's an awesome weapon and I think the only weapon that can compare to its greatness and maybe even surpass it is Eternal Super Shotty. This beautiful baby has an attached meat hook on the bottom that serves as the secondary fire. The meat hook pulls you into any enemy that's in range and it has this in range. Of course, it works on a cooldown, which is pretty quick. The techniques and freedom of movements and expression that this simple addition to an already beautiful weapon changes the whole game. During encounters, you are basically sipping through the battlefield, using enemies as slings for yourself to reach whatever demon you want to kill next. It really makes this game special and is one of the greatest achievements in gaming. I know I've said that a lot, but I genuinely think this game is the best shit ever. Just look at all the crazy shit you can do with this. It is unfathomable to me how this was achieved in my lifetime. Oh, and the cherry on top. Once the super shotgun is fully upgraded, the meat hook lights enemies up on fire, guaranteeing armor every time you use the meat hook to kill an enemy. This becomes integral to the combat loop in the final arenas. The sixth weapon is the chain gun. It is a big ass turret that looks like a minigun from a chopper that the slayer uses with his bare hands. The sound it makes is a thing of beauty. This is a high utility weapon and also one of the highest DPS weapons. The shield barrier mod pulls up a shield in front of the minigun, which absorbs damage and lets you keep on shooting. The shield also does damage and it falters on dash, which can easily melt heavies and super heavies. The other mod is the mobile turret which is a ridiculous concept that adds another set of minigun barrels. Once the mod is activated, the turret opens up and shoots like 100 rounds a second, which usually melts bigger enemies and big groups of enemies. It's not as lethal to things like the Revenant or the Whiplash, since you'll miss mo most of your shots because they're so goddamn slim. But when faced by a Tyrant or a Doom Hunter, this is a great choice. The Shield mod has a lot of uses outside of combat. A lot of difficult platforming sections can be cheesed with the use of the shield, since it will buffer all the fall damage that you take. The seventh weapon and the last of the regular weapons is the Ballista, which is basically a railgun from Quake. It has high accuracy and high damage, but it's kinda hard to aim, so it's usually reserved for long range encounters. This is another great weapon to use when targeting weak points and when dealing with a melee demon like a Hell Knight or a Revenant you'll most likely hit one of the shoulder rockets if you target a revenant with this. Also great for stunning marauders. One mod for the Ballesta is the Arbalest, which zooms in a little and charges a single shot that explodes after a second of hitting anything. It kills a Kako demon with a single shot and a Pain Elemental enters Stagger with two Arbalest shots. It's a great crowd control option. The second mod is one of the most overpowered things in the Slayer's arsenal. Similar to the microwave beam, but more pronounced, the destroyer blade, god that sounds awesome. It charges up a shot and consumes up to 66 plasma rounds and it slows you down considerably, almost locking you in place. Once the shot is charged, it fires a horizontal blade of energy that will literally cut demons in half if they're low enough on health. If that is not art, then I don't know what is. Just kidding. The last weapon that is not an unlockable is the BFG 9000, which is a power weapon with really limited ammo, two shots max, that serves as a panic button when shit's about to hit the fan during an encounter. It's really good to clear out rooms filled with demons, but will not kill super heavies. I think only the barons and the archpiles die with a direct BFG shot. The BFG 9000 is an staple of the series since the first Doom. If you complete all the Slayer Gate challenges, you get access near the end of the game to the Unmaker, a weapon that is a homage to another unlockable weapon from the series, which was the Unmaker from Doom 64 which is apparently this timeline's direct prequel. It's a meh weapon. It uses BFG ammo and shoots a spray of three projectiles to the front of you. It has its juices, but they're so technical and situational, I prefer to just have my trusty BFG shot in case things start not going my way. The Doomslayer will come across phantoms of sentinels during his journey that will give him tokens that he can redeem at Walmart for upgrades to his suit. These upgrades range from mobility stuff like climbing faster, dash charging faster, to things like having two grenade charges instead of one, 
or making frozen enemies with ice bombs drop health once damaged. There's also the upgrades for the weapons. You gain upgrade points through combat, optional secret encounters and challenges, like this layer gate. If you do everything in a level, you are guaranteed at least 10 upgrade points per mission, which is really good considering you need about 9 upgrade points to fully upgrade a mod. If you're being methodical with your exploration, you'll end the game with an overflow of upgrade points, room tokens for suit upgrades, and even the late game mastery tokens, which give the additional mastery upgrade to any weapon mod that usually requires a lot of grinding. So this helps the game adapt further to your playstyle. For example, the requirement for the precision bolt mastery upgrade is like a hundred headshots, which are easy enough to pull off, but getting to set number during mid game can be tedious and time consuming, especially if it's not one of your main weapons, as it's my case. So the tokens give leeway for all masteries to be obtained, regardless of your weapon choices. The platforming in the game was a topic of debate on its release. A lot of people felt frustrated by some of the more difficult jumps and platforming puzzles, but I thought they were only a break from the combat. Another thing I didn't understand was why people would want more combat in the game when they're complaining about how difficult it is. I think the platforming sections work to teach the player about mobility and some encounters use platforming mechanics during the battle, like pole swings placed around the battlefield. Since you have a double dash, a lot of the jumps are pretty tight and there's even a unique pickup used during some sections that recharges your dash charges in the air. <laughs> giving you yet another handicap in your favor during these sections. Once you become good at the game and learn it, the most difficult platforming sections take like 20 seconds top, so they're not a detriment to the gameplay at all. Pressing the tab key will take you to the dossier, where you can see the map, the codex, you can spend your weapon upgrade points, select your runes, which are up to three, and you find this around the levels. You use your armor upgrade tokens to improve the abilities of your power armor, the progression system is fair, and throughout most of the game you'll be constantly upgrading your weapons, becoming more proficient at killing demons, not only through upgrades, but through your own skill increasing as well, just like the Slayer as a character gets progressively stronger. Quick switching is an advanced technique that should be mastered as soon as possible. Unfortunately, console players are stuck with the weapon wheel, but it has been greatly improved since its release making it only a few active gameplay frames lower than using a keyboard. You may notice during my gameplay that I shoot a weapon and then quickly change to another weapon and shoot and repeat the process with multiple weapons. This is because you can exploit the cancelling of the reload animation by changing weapons during the reload and continue shooting faster than you ever could by using the same weapon until it runs out of ammo. Quick switching leads to creating combos that exploit the weaknesses of each enemy there is this huge list of useful combos for each demon. I'll put it up on screen, but of course you can get creative and create whatever combo you want and use whatever number of approaches you want. For you to be able to quick switch on a keyboard, you need to create your own keyboard bindings. This is, in my opinion, the biggest skill barrier that Eternal has. There's just no way around it. If you want to get good at the game, you must learn how to quick switch weapons. Let me give you a brief tutorial based on my keybind setup. Yes, this is stupid. This is the amount of keys Eternal expects you to memorize and combine during gameplay. It is really as complex as a mech simulator controllers, yet you're going to have to master your own setup. Use whatever keys you feel comfortable with. Some people have better response times with certain fingers, so keep that in mind. Don't put the crucible in the F key, for example. You'll be wasting one of the most accessible keys that I would recommend to be used for something that requires fast decision making, like changing mods or glory kills. The game is stupidly customizable. You are responsible for your success. So let me show you a great place to practice movement and quick switching. This is literally the starting point in Erdak. This place has ample space for you to practice moving, dashing, shooting, punching and shadow quick switch combo the air to practice the viability of combos that you want to experiment. Here I'm using a controller for purposes of trying to capture the console experience. Quick switching is possible and I've met some people in battle mode that totally owned my ass and were using a controller. That's insane. But okay, let me show some combos in practice. The most common starter for any combo is the meat hook super shotgun, which can then be followed by a precision bolt or ballista, then followed by a super shotgun, and then followed by a meat hook away, 
and then followed by a remote detonation on the face. Another great advanced and technical combo that requires dexterity and timing with your key presses is the highly damaging PV rocket PV rocket combo. You basically tear through enemies if you time it right. You can use remote detonation falter to exploit the falter animation frames for even more damage with something useful like full auto or destroyer blade. Combos in Doom Eternal are basically infinite. Let me do two comparisons and hypothetical case studies of these comparisons. Dante from Devil May Cry 5 has multiple styles and weapons that all make him one of the most fun and overpowered characters in any action game to master, and this is coming from the genre of games that Raiden and Bayonetta hail from. Dante has four different styles, in short, Trickster for dodge or dash, Swordsman for melee weapon abilities, Gunslinger for ranged abilities, and Royal Guard, which is a technical parry and blocking mechanic that's a whole other six on its own. Dante has four ranged weapons, Double Kalina N, a rocket laser, Ebony and Ivory, some handguns, Coyote, a shotgun, and Dr. Faust, a highly technical weapon that uses up the currency of the game as ammunition. He has four melee weapons, the devil sword or whatever for uh, a sword, a fucking motorcycle for sustained damage and animations, a pair of gauntlet and boots for an armed combat, and a pair of freezing nunchakus that turn into a flaming staff and can summon electricity. Okay, so imagine all the crazy shit that you can do with what I just described. Now, take that same concept, change the perspective into a first-person shooter, change the melee mechanics for the systems that are already part of the FPS genre, and finally, add layers of the complexity and freedom of player expression and you get Doom Eternal. The difficult tech and mechanics of the game are a great tool for performing your own combos, which is part of the appeal of these kinds of games, the customizability of your playstyle. Speaking of customizability, notice the color of this layer? It's not the same as in the cover or the artwork, huh? Well, the Doomslayer can be customized with skins that are awarded for completing challenges and almost everything in the game grants you XP that in turn levels you up in your season pass. <laughs> More like things I'll pass, am I right? What the fuck is that? That's the upstairs tenant. I rented out Mr. Plinkett's spare bedroom. All the guy does is play Doom Eternal all day. <laughs> Turn it down! Shut the fuck up! No one thinks games can be art. Sorry about that. Oh, it's fine. Fucking shit, you gotta be fucking kidding, right? Well, Doom Eternal is one of the least monetized games in recent memory. All the seasons, or whatever they're called, have been free for all the player base. Some have very limited events, but are usually shit cosmetics. Listen, I'm not a man that cares much for customizability in games. I prefer a well-designed character than a character whose hair color I can choose or their eyes. The skins you gain are just iterations on the texture and model of this layer. Some of them are cool, but the one I've been using since day one, and I just can't change it, it looks so fucking cool, is the Crimson one, which is one of the default skin that comes included with the game. I really don't need another skin, thanks. Everything else is just, uh, meh. For funsies, I guess. No utility whatsoever in the game that I know of, of course. But yeah, the topic of cosmetics is done. Crimson is the best skin. Best hand too. Let's move on. The runes are passive skills that customize your playstyle further. This is a nitpick I have with the game. I think that the air mobility rune should be an upgrade or just be the default for this layer. Air movement is so integral to the game and doing Miku slings and it requires air mobility. So there's really only two rune slots for this layer to use. Not having air mobility in your equipped runes is totally a detriment for the player. I don't understand the purpose of this, it baffles me. But yeah, the other two runes I choose are Equipment Fiend, which decreases the cooldown when killing demons affected by the equipment, be it a burning demon or a frozen one, or both. 
And the second rune I choose is Blood Field, which makes this layer go I'm fast as fuck, boy! for a few seconds after performing any glory kill. Chainsaw counts too. This is almost essential to the loop of the game. I used to have the glory kill range extender rune, but I noticed that having more mobility, even for a few seconds, is a great incentive for glory kills. Being able to become invulnerable during the glory kill and then finding an opening to escape is another great tool for your arsenal. I noticed during the editing of the video that I only sing Doom Eternal high praises and accolades. Yes, it's my favorite game and I'm very biased towards it. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have problems as a game. Remember, there are objective and subjective tastes. That's why I think reviewing a game on a numbered scale is pointless. I've always preferred ranking things as in Doom Eternal is my favorite game, second would be Bloodborne, and third would maybe be Tetris Attack. The game had a lot of updates during its life cycle that somehow added a lot of problems and it almost made it unplayable. There was this one time that the chain gun sound effects were so badly mixed in with the audio they could make speakers pop or really hurt you if you were playing with headphones. Turning the SFX down didn't help either. There was this stupid background noise of an almost whispering choir when viewing the map, which you will do very often during your first playthroughs. And there was this glitch that made the sound continue after closing the map, during cutscenes, in the menus, even leaving the level and reloading didn't fix it either. That sound is burned into my fucking brain. I hated playing this game for a while when this was an issue. Thankfully, they completely aborted the whole concept and deleted the sound file entirely. Thankfully, those are all the bad things I have to say about the game. We live in an era where games can be patched after release, giving them leeway and hindsight. This has led to some horrible mistakes, like Cyberpunk 2077, but some games utilize this to great success. Doom Eternal added the season passes, added multiple balance and patches to gameplay, both single player and battle mode, gave us two incredible DLCs, and gave us a free single player score based mode that could be its own DLC, which is Horde mode. We'll discuss each individual part later. And the season passes I've already discussed, but I didn't know where else to put this. Oh, just as a tiny side note before I totally forget the Crucible Sword. Yes, the super weapon that is a guaranteed one hit kill to literally any enemy in the game. I tend to never use it. It's not that I don't like it or that I think that it doesn't add to the cool factor or to the gameplay. During my first playthroughs, the Crucible Sword was a great crutch to have when revisiting levels. But the further you go down the rabbit hole of the mechanics of the game, you start noticing certain things that could have been worked on a little longer. I think the Crucible Sword was a half-baked idea, but not in a bad way. It serves as another panic button for players who are struggling in higher difficulties and boy was I one of them. There were a lot of times during my first Nightmare playthrough that I just had to turn the difficulty down to ultra violence. Getting the mechanics down and the combat loop of the game will take time and patience. The Crucible Sword is only one of the mechanics that serve as a favorable handicap for the player. There is also the inclusion of extra lives into the campaign itself. They can be turned off. I don't have them in my heart because it makes me anxious when I have less than 99 since hitting the max. But the way they work is that they revive you where you stand whenever you take a fatal hit. With full health and some invulnerability frames to get away from whatever killed you. Extra lives are another crutch for the players who struggle with higher difficulties or don't have the best reflexes. Yes, you will run out of lives. Yes, some encounters during your first playthrough will take 3 or 4 of your lives in a matter of seconds. This is normal. This was the sign. There is also another crutch, which is the sentinel armor. I never used this. You can thankfully turn it off in the menu, but when you die a few times in a row in the same encounter, the game will tell you before a checkpoint restart if you want to activate sentinel armor, which I think makes you almost invulnerable. I don't think these crutches are a bad thing, quite the contrary. I think that adding positive handicaps to a difficult game is great. It makes it more accessible to everyone. If you or anyone you know is having trouble with Doom Eternal and wants to drop it, the most important thing to know 
is that it is okay to lower the difficulty. It is okay to activate Sentinel armor. It is okay to run out of life. My gameplay is not at all representative of what an average player plays like. I'm not the best player in the world. A lot of techniques I have learned through seeing other people's gameplay. But my gameplay and whatever you see in there, be it good, great or bad gameplay, is the result of at least 500 hours of active game time. As with any fighting game, you can expect weeks of learning the game before you can expect to even challenge a competent player. This is normal, this is intended, and this was designed. The great thing about Eternal is that you have dozens of options to tailor your experience and make it accessible to you, not to me or the tryhard asshole who says that Sekiro doesn't require an easy mode instead of trying to explain why the difficulty is what everything Sekiro is based around. If you changed any aspect of it, then it wouldn't work as the intended experience. Yet, every Souls game sells like pancakes. Why? Because people know beforehand that they are about to experience hell. And yes, they paid for it. Some people like a challenge, and games bring that to the table. The experience of overcoming a challenge is core to any gaming experience. Becoming good at a game and wreaking havoc on your enemies or opponents through the game's mechanics is what every game is in the end about. That was already a long enough tangent. I'll have a section dedicated to a dissertation of the art of video games and my perspective on it. But for now, let's just leave it at that. Doom Eternal is constantly teaching the player in a sadistic and Pavlovian way what to do and what not to do. If you die, then in 95% of the cases, it will be entirely your fault. Sometimes some weird shit can happen, like a cutscene triggering just as a demon was spawning besides you, making you vulnerable to multiple swipes that can easily take an extra life and a lot of frustration out of you. These moments are few and far between, but when they happen, they will make you want to uninstall the game. I don't tolerate bullshit in my games, but this is so rare, and once you become very familiarized with the game, this kind of BS won't happen as much as your face playthrough. I'm really sorry to say this, and this actually works as a detriment to most of my arguments towards my main point of the video, which I will touch on shortly, but you have to get good. There's just no other way. The same way you cannot select another difficulty setting in Dark Souls, Doom Eternal will squeeze every ounce of your determination and resolve. It will sometimes break you. If you dare touch Ultra Nightmare, there will be moments when you will want to cry and break your keyboard. Death in this game is something that hits hard. It's something that's quick and always unexpected. Your failure is your own and you must learn from it and avoid making those mistakes that led to that fail state. So that's basically it. That is all that Doom Eternal expects that you know about the game for you to be proficient enough to clear it on the higher difficulties. It expects a lot of you, but the power fantasy that you achieve and the feelings you get once you get on the groove is like nothing else I've ever experienced in my life. This game is a dream come true for me. Everything that I expected from this game was surpassed because of the obscenely fun gameplay and combat loop. It's really hard to put into words how great this game feels to play. And this is my main source of inspiration on why I feel this game is art. Since, as I stated earlier, this is the culmination of more than 30 years of gaming development knowledge and experience. The legacy of its software and Doom as a franchise is fully realized in Eternal. This game is a miracle in my eyes, and its gameplay, specifically, its combat mechanics are crazy good. Oh boy, that was something else, right? This game is complex to the bone. It's an amazing feat of programming and engineering. Every system in this game seamlessly combines and creates a first-person shooter sandbox that mixes the action seen in character action games like Metal Gear Rising
first-person shooters like Quake 2. I needed to explain the gameplay thoroughly and have people understand every mechanic in the game to FINALLY get to my point with what I was originally talking about during the beginning of the video. Do I make myself clear? I'm sorry I wasn't listening. Ow! Fucking fascist! Back when I was just a little kid, I must have been three or four years old at the time, I have a blurry memory of my dad getting a laptop. This was way back in the 90s, so laptops were hot shit. I have no idea where it came from, but a shareware copy of Doom was in my dad's possession. Someone told him it was a great benchmark for the laptop or whatever. My big bro Cito and I installed it and we played it. The controls were weird and the sound was atrocious. I don't think the display was even colored, but this was one of my first experiences with gaming. I remember it like a dream. Time passed, but Doom was a game that my bro and I always came back to. There was something about it that always kept me hooked. I could play it for hours, lost in mazes looking for a hidden keycard or a door to use that same damn keycard. Doom 2 was something I rarely experienced as a kid, but I remember how incredible it was when I first saw it. Doom was still something I regularly installed on the family computer and had some great retro game nights in 7th grade. Doom was awesome. Doom 3 was good, but it was not a worthy successor to Doom 2. No way. Doom 2 was one of the most defining games of its generation. And to me, the first two Dooms were part of my development as a human being. I hope I got the importance that the Doom series has for me as a person through to you. It sounds like some shit some Star Wars neckbeard would say about the prequel trilogy, but I don't know, it was my childhood. I have vivid memories and dreamlike reminiscences of this game. Doom Eternal made me feel like the first time my brother booted up Doom 2 and I saw him play it. I was a child again. I felt childlike awe during my first playthrough of Eternal. It made me feel alive. It made me hopeful for the future. Because if I was alive to experience a perfect game, then eventually something will top it. And maybe I'll still be alive and be able to have a moment where I can say, this is objectively better than Doom Eternal. Well, this will be kind of pathetic and really was a moment I didn't want to touch upon on the video. But I think this serves as a statement to my point. The first time I played Eternal, Things were turning awkward in my life. I was about to graduate from med school. I had a girlfriend who we shared a lot of great moments and yeah, a game I had been hyped for for four years had just come out. I played the first four levels in a row. During my excursion to the cultist base, it started to hit me how fucking awesome this game was. I got to the arena where the floor falls down and you fight in a tight arena, a fight that gets progressively harder while the floor slowly fills with blood. The level design served the gameplay first, and then the artists filled each room with different assets that make almost every room in the game feel completely unique. You get to a part where you control a goddamn revenant with a demonic machine and fight other demons while flying and shooting rockets. They really didn't pull any stops when developing the game. They thought, what can make the player feel more badass? And they just added it. It's pure joy. When I arrived at the 4 level, Doom Hunter base, there's this part where you need to get to a platform and you need to activate it for it to move closer. You need to shoot a switch that's on the other side of the area. You climb a structure and you're standing on the edge. The wall on your left is covered with electric arcs that covered the whole structure. So you have to carefully walk and avoid the wall. All the while, gargoyles, cacodemons and shielded zombies are pushing you back. I really don't know what it was about that part, but a huge smile ran across my face. When I finally jumped to the other side, a tear started rolling down my face. But I wasn't sad. I was just so fucking happy that tears flooded my eyes. I couldn't believe that I was alive to experience this game. I never thought a game this fucking cool would ever get made. This moment cemented Doom Eternal as a masterpiece and a genuine piece of art in my eyes. I didn't want to add this to the video because of how pathetic it is that I cried while playing a fucking video game. But you know what? It's okay, man. Crying is not necessarily a bad thing. You aren't girly for expressing your feelings, more so when you're alone or with people you love. 
Sometimes things move your emotions to a point where the physiology of your brain stops working correctly and shit like this happens. Doom Eternal messed with my emotions in ways that few things have. Maybe it's because gaming has been part of my life since I have memory and the original Doom was the first game I remember playing as a child. Or Super Mario Kart, one of the two, don't blame my parents for what I became alright. But for me, that moment during Doom Hunter Base was something that changed me the same way End of Ava changed me. And I knew right then and there that I wouldn't see any video game the same way anymore. Doom Eternal is a game that is not accessible to everyone. A lot of gamers, especially people who didn't grow up playing what are now considered retro PC games like the first three Quakes, Blood, Unreal Tournament 1 and 2004, find it hard to understand the passion that some people have for in-depth mechanics and fast-paced action in their first-person shooters. I don't want to beat on a dead horse, but games have become staler as audiences have grown larger. When the first four Call of Duties represented the epitome of modern shooters, they have become right now nothing more than a cash cow that requires a yearly entry to maintain its fading stranglehold on the gaming industry. Same as with other mediums of entertainment. Video games have taken inspiration from other games, not because of their popularity, but because of their unique interpretation of those systems. It could be argued that the evolution of games has been paved by the greats. Movement of the player characters has greatly improved since the days of Pac-Man and Dick Dog. That is not to say that neither of those games have their merits, because at their time they represented a flagship of the industry that are recognizable to this day, especially Pac-Man. But during the mid-2000s, the industry grew in unexpected and dangerous ways. Roger Ebert explained in his article, Video games can never be art, that games are not art because they are an interactive medium with goals, rules and an outcome. Games can be won, and art cannot. Let's say a cathedral is a work of art, right? It's the work of many people creating the vision of another group of people who designed it originally. The cathedral is a representation of the house of God in that particular place. It's supposed to be a place of worship and reverence. If it's a gothic cathedral, then it surely has an imposing silhouette and size, while a more modern cathedral accentuates the beauty and minimalism of its architecture as a more welcoming place. My point is, the cathedral generates multiple feelings and emotions in anyone who sees it. It's a work of art to be appreciated. Plato and Aristotle say that art can be defined as the imitation of nature. That is to say, art seeks to imitate a natural occurrence that can, in turn, stir emotions in the audience. That's why dances, paintings, sculptures, even prehistoric wall paintings are considered art, because they represent a vision of the author. They are an imitation of the nature or reality that the author perceives. As such, art can be appreciated in one particular way. There is no way art can be interactive. The boundaries of experiencing video games as art are significant. Not everyone can just get good at a video game. Doom Eternal is a great example of this. Not everyone will have the same experience I had with the game because my tastes dictate what I like. And they are obviously subjective. Though I know there are people out there with tastes like my own, I know people enjoyed this the same way I did. If not, they enjoyed it even more. Games communicate to the player in many ways. One of them is through gameplay. Video games give the freedom for the audience to experience the work of the author in any way they see fit, set within the boundaries that the author gives. Another way is through gameplay. Great stories that have been told through games. One of the best stories I have experienced in a game is in Shadow of the Colossus. The game tells its story sparingly. The whole script for the game can fit in about 20 pages. Yet, it toils with your emotions. It makes you feel sad and melancholic during the whole experience. You start feeling the same resolve that your character feels. And during the game, your character noticeably gets physically worse being consumed by the curse that he was warned during the beginning moments of the game. The ending is brutal. Though the goal of the game is achieved, the ending leaves a lot of questions and the tragic but hopeful ending for the protagonist is perfectly crafted and telegraphed during the entire game. Team Ico, the developers of Ico, Shadow of the Colossus and The Last Garden deserve praise as some of the best storytellers in the industry. They elevate gaming as an art form in some impressive ways, and their games are some of my favorite games ever. 
I usually do get a lump in my throat during an emotional story, what can I say? I'm a hopeless romantic. But Team Ico games have drove me to feel sad to the point of almost crying during their saddest moments. Just a small comment about art in games. Music in games is generally very good. Of course, there are some games with the spiceable soundtrack, but I've been playing a lot of Shin Megami Tensei recently. The soundtrack of these games is the most outstanding aspect of them. They have some of the most experimental, metal, and just plain cool OSTs that I've heard. Listen to this song from the most recent entry. This could easily pass as a Porcupine Tree song or some other unknown Polish prog rock band. The soundtrack fits the game like a glove. The feelings the soundtrack convey are the same the game conveys. Mysterious, ominous, intriguing and weird. I love this soundtrack. I've already stated my love for the Eternal soundtrack, but I wanted to get my point across and talk about SMT5. Music is art in itself, and some video games have some fucking artistic shit in their soundtracks. Yet, you can say a movie is great just because of its soundtrack. The same can be said about games. Ironically, during the writing of this video, Core A Gaming released a great video on why games are still not art. He makes great points, and I think we arrive at the same conclusion, but I'll steal some pointers from him, like the Roger Ebert article and some other things. Sorry, Core A. Love ya. So let me get back on track. To quickly recap, art is an expression of an author's vision. Art is anything created by another human being which, in modern times, seeks to denote a particular aesthetic which, in turn, toils with the feelings and emotions of the audience, be it shock or awe. So how is Doom Eternal art? Well, those of you who have been paying attention to the video might have noticed that I dropped some hints on the feel of Eternal, and this is because this game achieves a feel that is unparalleled to any game that I've ever played in my life. Games have changed a lot since their humble beginnings. Since games are designed first and foremost as a product to be consumed by big audiences, they tend to stumble on the pitfall of following trends in the market and fall victim to the staleness we discussed earlier. You can already see Doom Eternal's impact on the industry, with additions to established franchises like Halo Infinite with the grapple shot that functions very similarly and even more freely than the meat hook in Doom Eternal, opening in unexpected ways the trademark combat loop of Halo games. Yet, Doom Eternal feels so refreshing. It feels like when you go to a friend's house party and you haven't seen each other in years. He serves you his trademark drink, and the taste of that drink brings back all the memories together. It's a celebration of what used to make games interesting in a mechanical sense. How a multitude of systems interacted with each other seamlessly to create a tailored experience and a sandbox that the audience can play around in. Yes, there is art within gameplay within the barrier of the technicalities and skill required to master the game. There is a power fantasy that is earned through developing yourself as a player. This is the art that no other medium can achieve. It took me about two hours to get to the point. I'm really, really sorry about that. Yeah. How we doing? I already watched two hours of your stupid video. Good, good, good. Time to move to phase two. There is no phase two. I'm not doing phase two. I did everything you said and it's over. This isn't over until I say it's over! Sorry, okay, relax, dude. One more phase, that's it. Let me make this video even longer with unnecessary examples from other games. This is Guilty Gear Strive. It's the 257th entry on the famous Guilty Gear series of fighting games. Guilty Gear is a series of fighting games created by Arc System Works, who also developed a highly acclaimed and a personal favorite of mine, Dragon Ball Fighters. Guilty Gear is an incredibly deep and highly mechanical and skill-based two-person 2D fighter in the vein of Street Fighter or King of Fighters. The specific genre of Guilty Gear and almost all of Arc System fighting games is an anime fighter. This is because the spectacle of the special moves, the animation and the mechanics of the game are similar to the style of the same things used in action anime like Dragon Ball, Saint Seiya or, God forbid, Naruto. 
I'm bringing Guilty Gear up because I think it represents fighting games strongly. Even if you don't play fighting games, similar to Tekken or King of Fighters, you may have heard of it or even played it with a friend at one point. I'm a big fan of fighting games. I think Arc System Works is a great and talented developer, and their games are shining examples of what makes this niche genre of gaming so special. The woman character with the wolf-looking thing is Giovanna. She's a new addition to the roster, this game being her first appearance. She's one of my favorite characters to use in the game, because her moveset lends itself really good for some sick and simple combos that can make your friends rage quit in a matter of seconds. Let's break down one of her most useful and dynamic combos. It's a simple 5 hit combo with a lot of potential for dynamism and adaptability during the combo. The combo consists of an opener, which is a long range horizontal dash done by inputting quarter forward and kick. Then a series of three auto kicks done by inputting forward and strike, which is the Y button on the Xbox controller. Then we finish the combo with a finisher. The simple one that I recommend is the quarter circle backward and kick. Has decent range and sends the opponent flying away, giving you room to breathe and maybe even repeat the combo if the opponent is caught off guard. What I love about fighting games is this. The ridiculous ways you can own your opponent and take half of their health bar with a perfectly timed combo. Of course, the requirement for this type of combos is practice and knowing your character's moveset. The big guy with the ponytail is Potemkin, another favorite of mine. This is a character that falls under the archetype of a grappler. As their name implies, they require you to be near the opponent to maximize damage and you usually want to stay as far away as possible from them as to not get grabbed as you will most likely lose most of your health if not outright die during the exchange. Potemkin has sick potential for clutches and comebacks, though he's very situational. He has multiple ways to achieve favorable situations. For example, one of his most devastating moves is a super, a special move that consume the tension bar at the bottom. This is the heavenly Potemkin Buster, which requires your opponent to be in the air to perform. You can either bait your opponent into jumping by using different techniques that will make your opponent have no option other than aerial, or you can use a knockdown move, such as Down Heavy Punch, which will send your opponent flying during a stagger that can open up the opponent to the devastating super. The amount of player expression relayed through mechanics in fighting games is staggering. Most people shy away from these types of games because of this. They get discouraged the second they see someone else playing at a mid to high level. They think that the journey to get to that skill is tedious, when actually, it's quite the contrary. More skills and complexity to your moveset gives you limited amount of experimentation for you to create your own combos and build strategies based on the moveset of your opponent. This is how matchups are calculated in games like Smash Bros. Melee, and also how tier lists are made. This also dictates the balance of the game, since if a character has only great matchups against the whole roster, then that character is unbalanced and means it has an unfair trait that gives him an edge over the rest of the roster. And the same thing can be said the other way around. A character that has bad matchups against most of the roster is an unbalanced character that is objectively bad to play as. Yet some people like to play the lower tier characters because the feeling of beating an objectively better character with a character that is, again, objectively worse is something that endorphin junkies crave, particularly in ranked online or offline PvP play. Player expression, as simple as it may be, is what makes games so interesting as an art form. Every person plays a game differently. They have developed fears and certain habits that are hard to break. I had to drop Skyrim. It made me anxious every time you opened the map and there were four new caves, 30 side missions that were just getting longer and longer in the quest log. I just wasn't having enough fun to justify having my self-diagnosed OCD-induced panic attacks triggered every five minutes. I understand the art in Skyrim 
It can be a beautiful game for the time. It was streamlining a complex system like Oblivion into a more digestible experience for casual players, which was a detriment to the whole Bethesda RPG and Western RPG genre. But fighting games and character action games like Doom Eternal allow the player freedom to play in a sandbox. They allow you to, within their very generous boundaries, do whatever the hell you want. It's up to you to make the game fun. The art in this game is how it achieves that fun and that particular feeling of being badass. Again, it's something that has to be played to be felt and believed. The only problem, as with many great art pieces, is that it sometimes is an acquired taste. And sometimes you need someone else to explain you why it's so good. What the artists achieve with what they had and how you as the audience are supposed to experience it. Or rather, the knowledge needed beforehand to understand the context and enjoy the art piece even more. And very frequently, like I expect for it to happen with this video, people either don't want to listen or just get bored and change topics during the explanation. Not all art is made with the intention of being beautiful or aesthetic. Some great art pieces are made with the intent to disturb or being uncomfortable. It's how the artist achieves this that makes it aesthetic and stands out on its own. Different people have different tastes. You accumulate these tastes during your development as a person and throughout your life. Everyone is particular in this manner. What I like and what I subjectively think is perfect is a complete off base and far from being an absolute truth. As such, I took the decision to name the channel what it is now. My opinion is biased and based totally on my tastes. You may not agree on it, but I try to be as objective as possible with my statements while using all the limited information I have on hand to discuss and debate the points, whether critical or dismissive, that others draw on this game. I also think that I really don't do much investigation. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, if, if I'm going to talk about a game, I'm gonna talk about a game from my heart. I'm not gonna do any any investigation other than, you know, specific sources like the Roger Evert article or things like that. <laughs> I'm sorry for the tangent again. Now, let's talk about the most difficult argument against my own, which is accessibility. Let's say I'm trying to convince my dad that he should experience Eternal because for me, it's the greatest piece of art that has been created. My dad's gaming experience is getting to the top 50 leaderboard in the Xbox 360 Live Arcade Edition of UNO. The dexterity and reflexes that Eternal expects of the player is way out of the reach of my father. There is just no way that my dad can have a good experience playing Doom Eternal. Also, his tastes are very dissimilar to my own. He likes westerns, historical dramas, prog rock and diet pepsi. He completely dislikes and dismisses everything sci-fi related. He doesn't say it, but I know he thinks anime represents the beginning of the slow death of civilization. He's far from a simple man, but he's no gamer. He has none of the skills, dexterity or reflexes that Eternal requires for it to be experienced and appreciated. But the niche audience that appreciates Eternal for what it is can analyze and disassemble the whole Doom Eternal experience to give our subjective arguments on what constitutes art inside Eternal. Doom Eternal gives you an incredibly varied moveset, as stated in the gameplay section. Your mobility options give you the ability to express your playstyle in a way that is extremely personalized. Doom 2016 had the basics right. Gone was the slow and methodical movement that required a dedicated button to sprint that left you unable to use your weapons and we had the movement of a speeding car back again. No aiming downsides except for a specific mods of weapons that changed the utility of the weapon entirely. Gone were the shooting galleries that made combat a slightly more complicated game of whack-a-mole and back was the aggressive and brutal arena battles that this genre was known for. Doom 2016 was the polar opposite of what shooters had become. When those games expected you to take cover to recover health, Doom 2016 wanted you to go in headfirst into combat so that you could get health back and continue ripping and tearing. Doom Eternal is a very complex game, same as a good fighting game. If you can get over the initial difficulty of learning your character and mechanics, you'll get a much more satisfying experience than if you just try to grab the controller or keyboard and have your power fantasy with the press of a few buttons. No, you must fight for it. 
You will fail a lot of times before you start noticing the patterns and opportunities to attack. You will earn your power fantasy. I think this is what turns people off from this game, since it is something that not everyone can get behind. Getting to learn something new can be a daunting task and people have busy lives. They have other interests and hobbies, they have jobs, so it's selfish for me to expect everyone to play a game and enjoy it as much as I do when it is this inaccessible to newcomers. Now, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't have it any other way. The difficulty levels in Doom Eternal are an excellent way to get you pumped to get better at the game. The first time I ran through this game, I went with Ultra Violence, as this is an experience that is tailored for people who have experience with Doom, but don't consider themselves expert. I had a really great time, until I started having difficulties when approaching Mancubi, or I was killed by a barrage of rockets because I got nervous during an encounter and a revenant took the shot. My first run was pretty hard. I had a lot of times I had to turn the game off because I started getting frustrated with myself for not being able to proceed at the difficulty level which was supposed to be tailored for me. I was being stubborn until I decided that I would change the difficulty just to see if the encounters got any worse. And no, not at all. What changes with the difficulty is the speed, damage and aggressiveness of the demons, and that gives you an opportunity to enjoy the game at your own pace. The amount of demons in each arena is fixed, so you can be sure that you'll have a very similar experience to someone who's playing the game in Nightmare, at least content-wise. Once I got good enough at the game, I did a Nightmare run, and boy was it an experience. By now, after 600 hours with this game, I can confidently say I know every mechanic and I can play this game as efficiently as most pro players, though I'm not even near as good as someone as Mayo or Zero Master. And the experience of getting good at a game is something that's very nostalgic for me, since some of my first experiences with gaming were with uh, difficult games like Mega Man X. Mega Man X has a lot of parallels in gameplay with Doom Eternal. You are going on a mission to stop an invasion on Earth that could potentially wipe out humanity. Your character starts out underpowered and can easily die from attacks. As the game progresses, both heroes become stronger and gain health upgrades, armor upgrades, suit upgrades, weapon upgrades, new weapons each level. Both X and the Doomslayer have a dash that is used for traversal and combat, etc. I don't know if these similarities are intentional or if it's just because it's a dude with an armor and weapons, so the parallels would be there always. But I think Eternal and Mega Man X are cut from the same cloth. Both are evolutions of a franchise and could very well be considered a spin-off for purists of the original Mega Man and Doom. Both heavily developed the main character's moveset in a way that it is the main appeal of the game. Both had two iterative expansions in the same engine that continued the adventures mere days or moments after each finale. Doom Eternal is a character action game as well as a first-person shooter. This is important because many other games try to adapt elements from other genres into their mechanics, and a lot of the times it doesn't work as intended or ends up getting abandoned by the industry as a whole. Sometimes it develops into its own thing, like Immersive Sims, which started as stealth games and ended up as full-fledged RPGs with multiple routes and endings. Doom Eternal combines the essentials of first-person shooters and action games, like Mega Man X and Devil May Cry. So combining multiple aspects of a lot of games, I just name a very few examples, Doom Eternal achieved something incredible. The game makes the player feel like they're in the shoes of an eternally angry dude whose sole intent is to dispose of every demon in every universe. The amount of violence that the player is allowed to express and impose on their enemies is cathartic in a way that nothing can be. The feelings of accomplishment when finishing a morale-breaking encounter and the determination that failure brings out of the player is something that only games like Dark Souls can achieve. In short, Doom Eternal is art because it generates emotions and feelings in the player which are unique. Whether it is great art, only time will tell. But for me, nothing has ever made me feel this way. The only thing I remember getting me to feel something as deep as Eternal was literally the end of Evangelion, though the feelings were totally different. End of Ava gave me existential dread, 
It was the first time I felt horrified at the prospect of an apocalyptic event or some cosmic horror seeping into our reality and destroying humanity because of some prophecies that must be fulfilled. It was an experience that changed me in ways that I never could have imagined the first time I started watching it. After watching the series and reading deeper online about it, I learned about basic psychology and theology concepts and made me interested in understanding the deeper lore and meaning of everything I watched from then on. For me, End of Ava is the best movie ever made. It's dread incarnated. Maybe I'll do a video on the future going more in depth, but for the moment I think this is enough about Ava. Let me get back to the argument that video games can never be art, posited by Roger Ebert. He conceded to some of the backlash he received. The most important one was that games as a medium are interactive and they need to be experienced in a certain way to be appreciated and only the people who can achieve that level of interactivity within the game, be it through overflow of knowledge from past gaming experience or through the learning of the mechanics organically by playing the game itself, only those people will be the ones who can appreciate the art in games. So the barrier for art makes it not universal. But the experience and the emotions are there for those that can overcome the skill floor any game demands. That's why games like Mario Kart are so popular, even among people that usually don't play games. Everyone is up for some Mario Kart, because everyone knows what a race is and how they work. The basic mechanics of the game are incredibly simple and don't require much more than pressing a button and occasionally moving the stick. Yet the game has complex mechanics that appeal to players that like to reach the skill ceiling like drifting and subsequent speed burst. And the game has rubber banding that applies to a lot of its systems. For example, if you're near the first place in a race and you grab an item, odds are you'll get one of the least useful items in the game. Whereas if you're near the last place, the game would concede more powerful items to you. This helps everyone enjoy the game, even if they're not winning the race. The power trip of getting a star or a blue shell is addicting and makes everyone enjoy the game at any time. So what, am I saying Mario Kart is art? Well, first, that shit rhymes, and second, yes, that's exactly my point. Every game is accessible in its own way. A lot of console and controller developers have released controllers that are designed for people with disabilities. Game developers add accessibility options like color filters for colorblind people, and some even go as far as using text-to-speech for people with disability issues. And that is the whole point. Games are supposed to be accessible to anyone, but in the same way your friends looked at you weird after you showed them the house that Jack built. <laughs> You're way too much of a wimp. Finish this video. Not every piece of art is meant to be appreciated by everyone. It's supposed to be accessible to everyone, and games are rapidly becoming more and more accessible, even in a financial way. Xbox Game Pass, I don't use it, fuck that noise, sets a precedent that can lead to great things in the industry. With over a hundred games in its library, including fucking Doom Eternal, for like what, $10 a month or something? It's great, I mean, if you use it, I'm sure you know more about it than I do. But I remember the shitstorm back when Gears 5 released and it came out release day on Xbox Game Pass and basically everyone played it for one dollar because of a special deal that, if I recall correctly, gave you three months of uh, Xbox Game Pass for one dollar a month. That was really unprecedented and a bold move by Microsoft. And with the recent acquisition of Bethesda, Activision and Blizzard, I don't know, things seem to be going well. At least for now. I wouldn't get my hopes up for the future since we've been cocked multiple times by big companies showing care for the customers only to fucking stab us right in the ass with some shitty cash grab tactic or product that serves only the major investors. Okay, back on track. Games are accessible. Like movies, they are supposed to be experienced by people who have the capability of appreciating them. For example, a blind person can't enjoy a movie the same way a deaf person could, and a deaf person can't experience Chopin's Nocturne Opus 9 number 2, but then what represents the art in video games? Well, as I stated earlier, art in my eyes is anything created by someone else that generates an emotion or a feeling in you. So games tend to generate emotions 
through the combination of their gameplay, their story, their mechanics, their music, etc. Like a movie. The elements of the movie by themselves are only a greater part of the whole. Blade Runner wouldn't be such a great movie if the miniatures were CGI or if the score was composed by John Williams. The elements of the movie combine to create a work of art that still resonates to this day. In that same way, Mario Kart gives the average person every tool to experience the game. Grandma can pick up the controller and with two minutes of explaining, she'll be ready to rip and tear the track. The experience is universal. Everyone who plays the game, regardless of the difficulty, will get a similar fun time. The representation of the worlds imagined for the game is an artistic recreation of a perception of nature that someone from the art team developed in their minds. I don't want to get too philosophical talking about Mario Kart. Doom Eternal, I think, represents a moment in gaming that will cement it as a crossroads and turning point in game development. People who are really into games love this kind of experience. Feeling a challenge and overcoming it is an experience unique to video games. Not every Taco Tuesday will be run into a horde of demons for you to bash their skulls in real life. This game is a power fantasy that is earned. This game will brutalize you and make you grow hair out of your chest. This game will, violently and without asking for permission, make you a better man, a more determined man, a more concentrated man. I used to think there were tasks that were impossible and unachievable. Then I beat Doom Eternal on Ultra Nightmare. That gave me the courage to finish med school. If I could be in the top 1% of the people who legit beat Doom Eternal UNM without cheating, then what the fuck couldn't I do? I literally became a better man with this game. And yes, I ulted forward once because some bullshit. I'm still too mad to remember and I don't care. That was unfair and I wasn't at fault for that death. I don't care what you think, you weren't there. That's why for me, Doom Eternal is the most important art piece in human history and will be remembered as the first game to express real art through gameplay. I made my point, but there are a few things that I would like to touch on about Doom Eternal before finishing this essay. Video games are a unique medium of entertainment and expression. The developer generates a complex base of systems and basically builds a sandbox where the player is left to his own devices to discover the game. Yes, in the mid-90s games started introducing less nuanced tutorials into their games, plastering the first hours of the game with unnecessary prompts and levels that only serve the purpose of teaching the player. Doom Eternal falls into this trap, but thankfully, as with a lot of things with the game, your experience is fully customizable. You can disable everything individually in your HOT and GUI, like the tutorials and tips that appear on the corners. What Doom Eternal failed miserably in was in the aspect of don't show, don't tell. I think that most art should be appreciated with no prior knowledge whatsoever, save for the author's context or previous works, and that is completely optional. And I don't understand the existence of things like traders. Why would you show important pieces of your work for free and without context? How many times in recent memory have you seen a trailer for a movie and then went and saw the movie and got disappointed that all the fucking good scenes were spoiled in the three or four or five minute trailers of each movie? What's the point of creating something if you're just going to spoil the experience beforehand? When Doom Eternal was announced, I saw the reveal trailer that shows the Slayer moving at a brisk pace while being surrounded by all the new demons in Eternal. I was sold immediately. I was in love, and I think I still am, in the same way a man loves his wife after she's given him his first child, with Doom 2016. Back when Eternal was announced, a sequel for it seemed like a miracle. Some people didn't like Doom 2016, but most people were hype as fuck for it. People craved information on Eternal. I didn't. When The Last of Us was announced, I saw the first trailer, and that was it. The atmosphere sold me. 
and I really wanted to know more. But time passed and I didn't see much of the game. I saw like 3 minutes of gameplay somewhere, but that was it. When the game released, oh god, I'm sorry to say, but it was my favorite game for some time. The story and the gameplay blended so well together, and the atmosphere was incredible. The story left you with a literal O face at the end, and the dialogue and characters were masterfully created. It was the most incredible feeling game I had played in my life. And it all had to do with the fact that I didn't watch any trailers and I wasn't as hyped as everyone else for The Last of Us. Back then, without the context and all the shitstorm that followed after that stupid fucking pedo bait DLC and the... Please, let's change topics. This topic physically hurts me. My point is, since then, I avoid, like the plague, any trailers and hype trains for upcoming games. I'll look for info on the game, like what the developers have to say and interviews, but I don't watch uh, fake gameplay. I, I don't want the story and the important events to be spoiled. When Doom Eternal was about to come out, they showed a final trailer, and the fucking icon of sin was spoiled. Even though I avoided all trailers, screenshots, and in this case, even interviews, because I wanted to have the purest and blindest experience possible. And still, I saw a post on Facebook that spoiled the fucking final boss of the game. What the fuck is wrong with you people? Why the fuck would you spoil an interactive medium? The surprises that games bring are some of the most interesting aspects they bring. Finding out a game has a secret boss or secret techniques that are supposed to be developed organically during normal gameplay. Why? Why? I just don't understand why. And hype, oh man, goddamn hype. What's the point of hype? Remember when episode 7 was announced? Remember the hype that revolved around it and how people were going crazy about the two second fade to black segments in the trailer? It was disgusting. Just get hyped that it got announced and go watch it once it gets released. Why the fuck would you pay money to go see something that you already spoiled by watching the same three minute trailers like 50 times in a row? I really don't get this mentality. This is just my personal opinion, please don't take it personally. But I think things should be experienced the first time as blindly as possible. The first time I saw End of Ava, I didn't even know what anime was as a concept. I just called them Japanese cartoons. But not knowing about the decades of history behind what Ava ended up being and just watching the finale without context led me to feel deep intrigue and interest in what the hell I just watched. Experiencing The Last of Us blind the first time was a beautiful experience. I got to know the side characters without having anything spoiled. I experienced the order and events of the story as if I was the one living them. It was beautiful. And even though I hate The Last of Us as a series now, I have fond memories of that first playthrough. Now, let's talk about Cyberpunk 2077. Remember the first gameplay cinematic trailer? I thought the graphics were just too perfect for it not to be CGI. And once the 40 minute vertical slice of gameplay dropped, I just thought, what the fuck? This is going to be the best game ever. And immediately decided that I wouldn't watch anything else about the game, as I usually do. Once the game dropped after like 4 delays, I booted my preloaded digital GOG porches and played it. The beginning hours of the game were a mixed bag. My PC is not the best PC out there, but I can play games at high settings and 1440p and get up to 60 frames per second consistently. Cyberpunk never ran well for me. I rarely got more than 50 FPS. Even running it on medium settings, 1080p, didn't help. The game was full of bugs, glitches, and it definitely felt incomplete. I was hyped for this game the same way I was hyped for, like, Last of Us. I thought it looked great, and I thought it had potential to be the best game ever. But delay after delay, the game began to look more like it was going to suck. Right before the game launched, CDPR, the developers, decided that they wouldn't give out review copies and that they wouldn't let any reviewers use their own footage after a two week long embargo or something. What? I played the game on launch, I thought it was okay for the first six hours, the intro was long and sometimes tedious, but I felt it was spreading itself too thin. I thought, it was an RPG, it'll eventually get better. And after 50 hours with the game, I can safely say, it doesn't get better. I wanted to create a character that were like a warlock or a necromancer from another RPG. I love building characters that use the enemy's abilities and area attacks that can fuck up enemies with you doing minimal work and just watching the chaos unfold. My favorite build in Diablo is the necromancer. 
You can build a necromancer in the game that hacks enemies' brains to make them attack friendlies. You can just sit back and watch shit go down until they inevitably spot you and you have to fight your way out, using, again, hacking skills to make their heads explode or super jumps to reach the roof and plan another attack. But it's just not fun. The game sandbox sucks. It's boring and yes, the game is spread too thin. The driving mechanics suck, the shooting sucks, the enemies become bullet sponges on anything other than normal, the menus suck, everything about the game sucks. <laughs> and clearly needed at least two more years in the oven. I can't imagine the amounts of cope that cybercocks had to discharge from their bodies to excuse this stupid game. If I wasn't hyped about the game, then it was just a minor disappointment in my life, and I can move on. I didn't build my personality. I didn't build my personality around a game that it didn't even love. Oh, cabron! I didn't build my personality around a product that it. Okay. <clears throat> I didn't build my personality around a product that didn't even launch yet. Fuck hype culture. Fuck trailers. Fuck everything spoilers. People should stop idolizing products and franchises, especially those that don't deserve it at all. Do it a goddamn drone. Budget cuts my ass. Eh, voy a llegar sembrando el terror en corto, buscando problemas. Eh, ¿qué onda? ¿Qué es el bueno? Eh, y ni me busquen problemas, güey, porque te los mato a la chica, güey. Así como ando un problemado yo ahorita. Si tú quieres ver un vato fallecido, búscame a mí a la chica, güey. Porque va a haber problemas, güey. No me muevan, güey, por ese lado de que, eh, ¿qué onda? ¿Qué aquí? ¿Qué te la chica? Porque ando bien mal yo, güey. Ando bien mal yo, madre. Y vale más que no me muevan, güey, por ese lado, porque no respondo, me vale pura if you skip the gameplay spoilers, skip this part or you'll miss out on a whole What's going on? moment. The Marauder fight at the end of one intense and large level is one of the highlights of the game. The moment is intensified by the fucking awesome cutscene that occurs right before the battle. A red portal opens up opposite to the blue portal you opened. Out steps a horned figure, with skin white as ash, with an imposing axe that is clearly made out of argent energy. He throws some threats and taunts at you. You were never one of us. You were nothing but a usurper. A false idol. My eyes have been open. Let me help you to see Slayer. And the Slayer and this new demon face off in a close range encounter that most people will fail in their first attempt. It's a one-on-one -on -one battle with a demon that can easily kick your ass. Your first instinct when seeing a demon is to start shooting, and that has always worked, until now. The Marauder pulls up a shield made of Argent Energy that is impenetrable from the front, and he will never deliberately turn his back on you. This means that you must find a way to exploit his attacks for a chance to hit him. If you shoot him while he has his shield up or a demon projectile hits his shield, he will summon his ghost dog. He has multiple types of strikes. He can throw energy from his axe that does decent damage and has decent range. If he gets too close to you, he pulls out a super shotgun and blasts your ass with massive damage. He can dash twice and runs a little faster than you, and the ghost dog will chase you down and sandwich you and cram some delicious demon meat down your throat. So the way to go is to keep moving and have him chase you. Once you are in a midpoint between close and mid range, the Marauder will do a lunging attack with his axe, which makes this piercing metallic sound and his eyes glow green. This is your cue to shoot something big, like a ballista shot or a super shotty. This will daze the Marauder, which gives you a chance to take out another weapon and begin doing what I call a combo on the guy. The most basic combo is super shotty, ballista, super shotty or ballista, super shotty, ballista. This works great for the first times you fight the Marauder since the game will now be expecting a lot of you, and things will only get more hardcore from there on. The Marauder was a point of discussion when Doom Eternal released. A lot of early reviews viewed the Marauder as a detriment to the gameplay loop, saying things that his presence in an arena goes against the design of the combat. Well, yeah, that's the whole point of the Marauder. 
The Marauder is a demon designed to make the player uncomfortable. It's supposed to throw you off. You're supposed to pay attention to the Marauder and analyze its movements and exploits his weaknesses. Yes, his first appearance will make you look like an idiot. If you don't know what you're doing, you are going to die. A lot. But as with everything with this game, practice and patience will deliver the outcome in your favor. It's all about mastering what the game has already taught you from the beginning and adapting your arsenal to that situation. This game rewards patience as well as aggressiveness. It pays to be patient as much as it pays to keep the pressure on the enemy. There's also the Tyrant, which was known as a Cyber Demon in the original Doom 1 and 2. It's basically a decent damage dealer whose attacks are highly avoidable and a tank that takes a shitload of damage. You literally run out of ammo for some weapons before you kill the guy, so it's a good idea to charge him once you've just stocked up on ammo. And the Archvile, oh my god with this guy, he's a long range summoner who can also summon a pillar of fire at your feet. This little bitch likes to hide from your line of sight while buffing up other demons and summoning a shit ton of random demons on the arena. He's a real pain in the ass because he has the ability to teleport at any time and though he can be easily faltered, he can just as quickly escape from a combo and immediately summon another horde of demons right next to you. He seems like he was programmed to be as annoying as possible, and I love him for it. When you hate an enemy this much, it's because an enemy is designed with much care and attention. Think something like the bosses in Ninja Gaiden. They're cheap as hell, they can take half your health bar with one almost unavoidable attack. But once you get him down, once you discover a way to exploit their behavior, that's when it clicks. And I feel that happens to me with every demon in this game, and that is just amazing. There's a lot of demons to kill in this game, and each one of them has a gimmick that can and needs to be exploited for you to be as efficient as possible. Another aspect that a lot of people took issue back when the game released were the sections where you are forced to slowly travel through a purple viscous liquid that filled many levels. In numerous cases, this means that hidden tentacles are buried beneath the liquid and can pop up at any time and take a considerable chunk of your health. Okay then, let's move on. I'm kidding. I really don't have a lot to add to this argument. My personal view on them is that they serve a purpose for experts and veteran players of the game, since they require memorization of the levels, and the levels in Eternal are stupid, stupid thick. Thick. but they take anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour or even more to complete. The first time experiencing a level is incredible. There are a ton of hidden secrets throughout the level. Finding the way to get the Slayer key on your own the first time around feels amazing. The auto map is similar to the one in Metroid Prime games, but with a lot more detail added to the texture, as well as making it easier to get your bearings when you're first learning the game. So Purple Goop, for me, only represents part of the level. That's it, they're a section that the developers intended to be slow, grating and frustrating. The grand majority of people hate water and ice levels because they usually introduce mechanics that can feel awkward, but they are a part of the game where maybe an experiment from the developer's good intentions became a frustrating part for players. The Ocarina of Time Water Temple is infamous for making you fiddle with menus and slowly traverse through a literal four-floor maze of traps and manipulate water levels and use spatial thinking to solve multiple puzzles that tease your brain and deliver dopamine in humongous quantities once finished. And also, you fight a shadow version of yourself during one of the most memorable minibuses in history. Yet, people still focus so much on the bad parts of the temple that they tend to forget how awesome the concept of this level is. The aesthetic is seared into my brain. You have to think about how flooding the entire temple with different volumes of water will affect your path and help or impede your progress through the level. An item that could only visually work in a 3D space is realized with the iron boots. Yes, the implementation was really rough, but the idea was well intentioned, and there's numerous moments in that tempo that are some of the best in the game. That's my opinion on Purple Goop. If you're one of those cocks who say Ocarina is their favorite game ever, then let me tell you some things that make fucking Ocarina of Time worse than Doom Eternal as an experience of art through gameplay. Here's a big tangent incoming. And I, I, I love Zelda, okay? I just... Uh, okay, the combat in Zelda was revolutionary, but created and standardized a lot of pitfalls 
that got worse and worse through the years. Remember fighting lethal foes? Or how about the stealth foes that jumps out in the shadow temple and you have to fight? Awesome fucking fights, right? Moments of pure gaming bliss and joy. Yeah, if you consider the birth waiting to be part of the definition of fun. Waiting for an enemy to attack is not fun. You might say, well, you have to wait for the Marauder to attack. Uh, aha. You also have to defend yourself from five other smaller demons that are harassing you from afar, and you have to dodge all the ranged attacks that the Marauder throws at you, and if you attack the Marauder while the shield is up, he'll summon his ghost dog. Getting too close to him will result in a super shotgun blast to your face. The Marauder can dash idiotic distances, and only when he whiffs his axe attack is he vulnerable for a few milliseconds for you to fire. There is an immense difference between the combat and the gameplay in Ocarina and in Doom, that the comparison is almost pathetic. The audience between Doom and Zelda is so different that I think I'm the only person in the planet to have played and completed all the games in both series. Don't get me wrong, I love Zelda, and it's grandiose and epic when it all comes together. The ending sections of all Zelda games are the highlights, and Ocarina delivers buckets of pure gaming bliss in its final moments. The fight with Ganondorf, and especially Ganon, is, for some people, the best final boss fight in the series. I don't know if I agree, the hype build around the fight in Twilight Princess was hype as fuck, and the last fight in Skyward Sword was nothing short of beautiful. But let's be real here. Games are supposed to deliver experiences that can't be experienced in any other medium. I already touched on this on my dissertation of art in video games, but let us continue with the Marauder before I forget what I was talking about. The hot dog combo. This is a simple combo that can be used to exploit a few frames of animation that the Marauder suffers when faltered. The Marauder sporadically summons a ghost dog that chases you down. This dog is summoned when the Marauder is hit while his shield is up but he can cancel the summoning to perform an attack if you're close enough. Once the dog is summoned, run away from the Marauder and use the microwave beam on the dog. Since the dog and the Marauder are usually close together, the explosion from the microwave beam will most likely cause the Marauder to falter, which will in turn allow you to get a shot in with something like the Ballesta or a remote detonation rocket. This is only one of the many ways that Doom Eternal allows you to experiment with its mechanics, and it's just out of this world, man. Again, I'm going full spoilers with the story and the gameplay of both DLCs. I'm just going to gloss over this just to be thorough with my favorite game. In short, yes, I do recommend The Ancient Gods Part 1 and 2. Both are great experiences that continue and improve, subjectively, on a lot of aspects in the game. If you love Doom Eternal's base campaign, then you'll at least like The Ancient Gods. Moving on. And now we get to all the side dishes that Doom Eternal has. I think Ancient Gods was the dessert after an awesome meal. In the middle of part 1, I noticed that the Slayer didn't have his Crucible Sword, and this is because he left it impaled in the frontal lobe of the Icon of Sin, so you have one less crutch. I like that. This is telling the player, listen brosito, you're supposed to already know what you're doing, so here's some damn good challenge to test your metal, kiddo. When part 1 released, the first encounter was brutal. It has been nerfed since then, I think, but I remember thinking, holy crap, chill out, it's only been 10 minutes and I've already died like 5 times, but man, what a great start to the DLCs. The graphics didn't receive an overhaul or anything, more than anything, this DLC is more Doom Eternal, which is exactly what I hoped for it to be. The places you visit, same as with the base campaign, are completely unique to each level. Though the three places are pretty iterative design-wise of UAC facilities, Hell or Necrobo, and of course, Ordak. Same as with the campaign, 
The music for the Ordek level fucking sucks. But everything else is pretty okay. Levi and Holschuld made some banging tracks for this DLC and continued the legacy that Miss Gordon left behind. I wouldn't call it anything other than great, but well, they had to compete with the original soundtrack and you know that shit's unbeatable. Let's get on with the story, as quick and direct as I can. After the events of the ending of the base campaign, the Slayer must get to Erdak and save it from corruption or something, to restore the balance of the universe. Since the war left some damage on reality, the UAC keeps leading the way for the invasion. Thus, demons keep invading Earth. First, we must reach a Seraphim and revive him some way, apparently using Hayden's consciousness. And it's then revealed that, surprise surprise, Hayden was a Seraphim all along. The Seraphims are basically direct servants of the Father and have the ability to revive ancient beings with the essence of the soul or whatever. The Seraphim tells us to go to the blood swamps and get to some kind of sanctum that's located in an unreachable place in that part of hell. So to get to it, we need to pass the trials of Maligog basically traverse the blood swamps, with a lot of perils and weird shit in the way. You encounter a buff totem enclosed in a cage, making it unreachable, followed by a marauder in an enclosed arena, and fighting with a buff marauder is fucking tragic. I don't know how, but they gain IQ points with that buff. What the fuck? After that, we then get to the final trial, which is a miniboss that consists of two cubes that have an eye in the middle that sporadically opens up. You're being chased by a pinky and a hell knight and a lot of other demons. Uh, I mean, a lot of other father demons. The fight is intense and pretty good. One of the highlights of the DLCs. The level itself is okay. The part with the dog and the damaging fog can be kind of annoying in your first playthrough. And some of the secrets have their icon appearing way before it's appropriate to get them. So that can disorient you, but maybe it was intentional. The platforming sections in this level are pretty cool too. After that, the Slayer reaches the Sanctum where the essence of the Father is stored. He grabs the essence and destroys it in his hand. He then grabs the Dark Lord's essence and fucks off, leaving the Seraphim agonizing in the ground. Uh, this is because apparently uh, the, the Makers, all of them need the Father to exist, at least as a presence or an essence, for them to uh, not die this way. With the essence of the Dark Lord in our hands, the Slayer's intentions are kind of convoluted, but here is his logic. He seeks to revive the Dark Lord into a physical form so he can then kill him and stop Hell's existence. Since the Father would forgive all his creations, he would forgive the Dark Lord and revive him himself, maybe to restore balance or something. But in the end, it doesn't even matter, since the Slayer tried so hard and got as far as to destroy both the Dark Lord and the Father ensuring their mutual destruction, and thus, the continued existence of mankind. The Seraphim put his trust on him, and he pushed as far as he could go. In order to revive the Dark Lord, we need to reach a place in Erdak called the Halt, in which the last of the living Seraphim reside, and the Seraphim have another sanctum in which they can revive any being as long as that being's essence is given to the Seraphim. If I recall correctly, the Father gave strict orders to the Seraphim to allow anyone to revive any being in order to prevent divine paradoxes. Or something. There's this part in the hold where the floor is lava and you get surrounded by some caco demons. I love the first phase, but the second phase makes the walls lava, so it's actually a lot harder, at least for me. So after fighting Samur, the Seraphim that turned out to be Samuel Hayden all along, we fight Samur in one intense arena battle. 
Samur teleports like the Archvile and has about four faces. Each one is pretty different and you're almost always being harassed by a Bloodmaker. The father tells us that our mission is done and lets Samur escape. And the Slayer reaches the Seraphim Sanctum and revives the Dark Lord. which looks exactly like him. And the first DLC ends with that cliffhanger. That was a pretty good cliffhanger and left me hooked to see the ending. I just thought the fight with the Dark Lord would be awesome. You'd be fighting yourself like in Ocarina of Time. Just imagine that, it could work as an experiment for a deathmatch multiplayer mode. And then the second DLC hit. Before we get onto the second DLC, let's talk about other additions that part 1 brought. The Bloodmakers are a new kind of enemy that have an impenetrable shield that surrounds their whole body. The only moment when he's vulnerable is when he is about to do a highly damaging ranged attack. Same as the Marauder, there's a metallic screech that resonates before the attack begins, and you have about half a second to hit them with a headshot, which confirms their kill. They drop a lot of ammo and health. Their ranged attacks fuck up your mobility so they become a pretty high priority target when they appear in the battlefield. The game now has a Spectre variant, specifically the Whiplash now has an Invisible variant, which is as deadly as it sounds. They are designed this way because the developers noticed that people were killing Whiplashes mainly using the Lock-On Burst, which is fine, but it made the Whiplash pretty underwhelming in the combat loop. Making him a Spectre makes it impossible for you to lock on, either with the Lock-On Burst or the Microwave Beam which means you have to use other strategies to overcome the whiplash in his new form, in her new form. I love him and I wish that the game even had more Spectre variants introduced. The Spirit is another new uh, enemy in the game. It basically works as a hyper buff for demons and a possessed demon by the Spirit glows blue. He cannot be faltered and they move and attack like three times faster. And once you finally kill the possessed demon, the Spirit explodes out of the corpse and starts trying to possess another demon. You have to use the microwave beam and destroy it, making people that didn't even touch the microwave beam before the DLCs start noticing its nuances, like the stupid falter range the explosion has. The final battle has you fighting two possessed demons in two of its faces, easily one of the most brutal encounters in the whole Doom Eternal experience. We also get introduced to giant tentacles. The first time I saw one of these, I laughed my ass off and had to pause the game because this is just a big fuck you to the players who complained about the tentacles present in the base campaign. It's basically saying, oh yeah? You thought having to memorize where a few tentacles in a level was kind of bullshit from our part? Well, here's a fucking giant version of that same thing you hated. Have fun. They're annoying and stupid as hell. I just can't hate them. It's way too funny and on the nose. Oh god, I almost forgot about the Slayer Gates. The Slayer Gates in the DLC give you access to special rooms. One gives you back an extra life if you can quickly kill the demon that took that life. Another one makes your blood punch stronger when you're about to die. This is kinda useless. I don't find utility in it. The blood punch already falters demons. That's all you need for it to be a panic button. The last one, the one that I use, is the weak point explody one, which creates a big explosion that hurts and staggers demon near to any weak point you destroy. This makes it even more useful to go after weak points. The extra life one is great if you're studying the game, but the weak point one is amazing. Only one of these rooms can be equipped at a time, but they have their own slot, giving the Slayer 4 room slots in total. The turrets also appear for the first time in this DLC. They're basically stationary imps with a higher rate of fire. The gimmick here is that you have to pull two headshots in a row to destroy them. If you take too much time between shots, it will turtle into its base and you have to wait for it to start attacking again. They work more like a nuisance and add a little to some of the platforming challenges, but they're quite forgettable.
the second DLC begins mere seconds after the first one ended. The Doomslayer and the Dark Lord stare each other off. The Slayer lets out a super shoddy, which gets deflected away by a barrier. Turns out that the altar or whatever is a holy place and no harm can be done in there. The Dark Lord says that he'll be waiting for him in the city of Imora, which is the capital city of Hell, located in the deepest layer of Hell's dimension. So we must journey to find the capital of Hell. Our adventure begins in a place, apparently in the dimension of Arjun Denor, that's in front of a cosmically big crystal embedded in the distance. This is the World Spear. We must reach it to find a crystal that will help us get to Imora. We travel through this place, finding new enemies and using meat hook grapple points that are just beautiful and add a ton to any arena they're in. The second DLC's version of Slayer Gates are awesome. They are gorgeous that have two phases. The first phase is required to progress, but the Escalation Encounter, which is the second phase of that same gorgeous, is an overpowering battle against a horde of demons in the same arena as the first phase. The music tends to fuck during this moment. They're a great addition. Going to the same arena and only twice in the first part was kind of disappointing. So this way you have an intense arena battle that consists of two phases that test your skills. We get the sentinel hammer in this level, which replaces the crucible sword. It's an AoE attack that makes the slayer jump in the air and crash into the ground with the hammer, creating a devastating shockwave that dazes enemies. If you remember back in the gameplay section, I explained that marauders need to be dazed. Well, the sentinel hammer enables a super daze that lasts several seconds. You can easily melt any demon, including marauders, with this super daze. We find a torch that apparently will tell every remaining warrior in Argent Denor to take up arms and join this layer in a fight to the death with the forces of hell. A dragon appears out of the sky and takes this layer in his back to the foot of the world spear. A bridge in a lake filled with fog rises at the end and we reach the spear. We enter, take the crystal, see some weird holograms of what appear to be makers. There are also some type of stasis pots in the distance that have like the rates that you stab with the crucible at the end of 2016. I don't know what's up with that. We take the crystal and then return to earth to use the crystal on a slip gate and enter Emora. We get to the reclaimed earth and it seems that Earth is slowly recovering from the invasion, but humanity is still nowhere to be found, at least alive. We need to reach the Gate of the Boon, which is a gate that will take us directly to Imora with the crystal we got at the World Spear. We reach the Gate of the Boon and get pulled onto Hell's Dimension and reach Imora. The Imora beginning cutscene is the most tacky thing in the whole of the Doom Eternal experience, but it's so fucking good.
This level tanks my FPS big time, and that's just because there's a lot of shit going on at all times. If you look around, you'll see sentinel mechs fighting against titans in the background, a dragon launching fireballs at Hell's army. It's awesome, man. Pure schlock. I love it. We reach the city of Imora, and in turn the Dark Lord's palace. After some grueling encounters, and... Remember how I said that Doom Eternal was like a Saturday morning cartoon? Ancient Gods Part 2 is top tier schlock. If it weren't for all the demonic references, this could be easily an 80s cartoon. The fight against the Dark Lord is pretty disappointing, because I was expecting fighting against an evil slayer, with some unique differences to make him interesting. But this is basically a multi-phase Marauder fight. It's okay, and you have to use the Sentinel Hammer to melt his health, but it's really underwhelming for an ending to the story of Eternal. Turns out that the Dark Lord is the creator of the creator, uh, like a primordial being that existed before everything, and everything in turn owes its existence to him? I really don't get it, but apparently Hell's Dimension existing or the primordial plane and any entities that reside or hail from it would disappear from existence if he were to die. Pretty convoluted if you ask me. At the end of the battle, the Slayer kills the Dark Lord. Before you strike him down. which in turn destroys every demon in the universe and closes the connection between the other dimensions and hell. This also means that the Slayer will cease to exist, because his existence depends on the existence of the Dark Lord, since they're one and the same, just from different realities or dimensions. The Slayer is once again imprisoned by the Seraphim and the fight of the Slayer seems to be on hiatus for a while. He'll take a nap while shit steers in the universe. The new enemies that this DLC introduced are the Screecher Zombies, which will buff any demons nearby if they are so much as touched by an explosion or shot. The buff is similar to the Spirit buff, so you gotta be extra careful. The Riot Soldier was a fan request to get the Chain Gun Zombie from Doom 2 into Eternal, but they're pretty underwhelming. Grenade their feet or shoot a remote detonation rocket to the side of them and they're done. They can be a nuisance if you're not careful, but nothing out of this world. Since their shots are projectiles, they can be easily dodged. The Stone Imp is a variation on the normal Imp that has hardened skin that serves as an armor. Weapons that create ultrasonic vibrations or something deal extra damage to their skin, so the full auto is a must, or the micro missiles. They have a spinning dash attack similar to Sonic, they charge full speed and have bad turning, so exploit that. A sentinel hammer near them is an instant kill too. The Cursed Prowler is a variation on the Prowler that curses you if you get hit by him. While cursed, your dashes are ineffective, you do less damage and take poison damage yourself, so you gotta blood punch the Prowler that cursed you to stop the curse and keep on kicking ass. They are annoying as hell, and they move much more erratically than the normal Prowlers. The Armored Baron is a variant of the normal Baron that has a Morning Star for a right hand, that is actually his weak point. Same as other demons, only before attacking is the weak point vulnerable for half a second. Destroying the weak point destroys the entire armor and makes the armored baron vulnerable, so you must take advantage of that situation and attack with everything you've got before the armor forms itself around the baron again. They're a pretty cool addition and anything that makes the baron tougher is a jess in my book. The demonic trooper is a joke. It's a dude that takes one shot to kill and drops ammo. The gifts have been gravely improved since the release, but they're not even a nuisance. They're even less memorable than the infection forms of the Flood. I love the addition of these DLCs in the game. They were just what fans wanted, more Doom Eternal. The story is meh, but the game itself is awesome. It adds a bunch of nuances to the combat loop 
and the encounters are pretty fun, all things considered. If you enjoy Doom Eternal's base campaign, the DLCs are a no-brainer. Battle Mode is an asymmetrical multiplayer mode in which two players play as demons and another player plays as a slayer. <laughs> that, that rhymed a lot. I'm going to try and explain it the way I understand and play it. And I'll just use the Pain Elemental as the example demon, since that is my main. Just to be clear, I don't play Battle Mode, except when I'm especially bored or to get more XP for the events. So if you think I suck, then have the comfort that I haven't spent more than 50 or 70 hours TOPS on it. The demon you choose, its loadout and the progression of your demon will determine if you're a tank, a healer or a DPS. All demons have an offensive and a healer loadout. Well, they used to have. I, I played it today and they don't have that anymore. You uh, Or I don't know if I lost it, but you cannot choose anymore your loadout before starting the battle okay whatever the offensive one used to give you a speed and damage boost and the healer one used to give you access to support skills like uh, a healing like field so you used to be able to summon demons and each playable demon used to have two different sets of skills and the demons uh, that you used to uh, be able to summon for each playable demon used to be different for each loadout. The Mancubus is heavy and slow, but he can melt the Slayer's health with flamethrowers, while the Marauder is fast and nimble, but requires a lot of precision and risk-taking to make the most out of him. My demon of preference is the Pain Elemental, because he has great mobility and is a goddamn annoyance to the Slayer, and has a lot of options in his progression tree to adapt to the Slayer's strengths and weaknesses. He shoots lost souls directly in front of him that deal moderate damage and can summon a shield in front of him that makes him vulnerable from the front. He has two air dashes that can be upgraded to recharge really fast. The shield can be thrown before it expires causing massive damage and can be upgraded to the night terrain. Since he floats, he has great visibility over the battlefield and can stalk the slayer while the other demon harasses him. And once the Slayer armor is down, you can go both gank for the kill. Playing as a Slayer is fun as hell, when you're playing against demons on your skill level or a little below. Playing against noobs can be boring, since it's almost a guarantee they won't even finish the match. And playing against pros is tedious, because people have spent thousands of hours exploring this mode and all its exploits, giving us single-player casuals a headache when we get to play with them. At the end of each round, each player chooses a passive ability that buffs your character in a specific way. Again, a fucking ability for this layer is air control. But whatever, each demon has a different set of these choices. So it's best to get better at a demon you like than trying to be a jack of all trades. In the third round, you choose a super ability, which can summon a Baron of Hell, heal you and the other demon, or instantly resurrect your partner. The Slayer can get a BFG, Sentinel armor and other goodies in the third round. This is a great mode and I've had some fun with it. I would have obviously preferred a deathmatch mode in the style of classic FPS's, but battle mode is an alright alternative. Horde mode was added in update 6.66 near the end of 2021. It was touted as the ultimate update and added a lot of minor changes to balance of the gameplay. Big changes to battle mode the introduction of leaderboards for multiplayer and a semi-ranked mode with win streaks. And finally, Horde Mode. This mode consists of you going through the eternal experience in a three-level progression. It gets pretty difficult, but it's nothing that can't be done. You start with a lot of lives and get a generous amount of them during the multiple levels. Horde Mode is comprised of three levels. Each level consists of five rounds, three arena battles and two bonus rounds. The arena battle rounds consist of three or four waves. There are bonus waves that are won if the value targets are killed quickly to score even more points during specific moments of the battle. These are changing with seasons, so memorization is needed but will become obsolete anyways. I also forgot to mention that at the end of each round you get a weapon, of each uh, arena round you get a weapon, 
For example, you always will start with the combat shotgun and both mods and, you know, your Slayer is fully upgraded and everything. And you can choose your runes at the start of the Horde mode. And uh, the thing is that you start with only the combat shotgun. So you don't have the super shotgun. That means that you don't have the meat hook. And it, you also don't have the microwave beam. So if you don't get the microwave beam before you start uh, the second level, then you will have a lot of troubles because the spirit starts appearing in those levels and you will encounter him. Uh, and, and, and if you don't have the microwave beam, it's gonna be a problem because it's gonna try to possess other demons that are near. And, and if you have to make the decision if you kill it at the last moment, the, the possessed demon, or, or if you start killing demons around the possessed demon and, and uh, you know, uh, tactically decide which demon you, you're going to leave at the end so that it gets possessed, you know. So it, this makes the horde mode, each time you play it, it's going to be, uh, well, not completely different because there, there are not that many weapons that can make a, a, a high difference. But it, 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 I'm not really... Um, For example, the, the, the combat shotgun and the, uh, com the heavy cannon, if I get that combination, I tend to, like, it's, it, it's worthless. Like, you don't have any of the tools that are really helpful with movement, with defense. You only have offensive options, you know? So that makes it really interesting, and I think it's a great addition to the game. The, the fact that, that you don't start with every weapon, Uh, you, also, you, you only start with a fully upgraded Slayer. So you have to start getting the weapons at the end of each round. And, and, and that's how you get better. Uh, you, you need to... Uh, uh, if you want to get the highest score, uh, you're going to have to do a lot of restarts. Because uh, you need to get good weapons. You know, if, if, if you get the, 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 uh, the heavy cannon on, at the end of the first arena round then Jesus Christ, you're gonna have to restart your run. What you want is, is to get, I don't know, the plasma rifle or or the minigun, or I think you you get the combat shotgun. I don't know if you get it on the first level or the beginning of the second level, but there's a chance that you will, there will be a lot of rounds, arena rounds and traversal rounds that you won't have the, Uh, the su the super shotgun, you know. So if if you don't have the super shotgun, then you don't have any like. It's like if they cut off your legs, bro, you know. <laughs> so it's very interesting what they did with this mode in that sense. The bonus rounds are either blitz or traversal rounds. Blitz gives you a time limit to kill a determined amount of demons. Killing them faster will grant more points for your score. Traversal rounds are just that. You traverse a stage with hazards and collect coins. The faster you collect all the coins, the better score at the end. When you kill the bounty demons during an arena round, they'll drop a multiplier upgrade that will make either three times or four times damage as well as a score. It's up to you as to when you activate it, but you might want to use it when you're surrounded by heavies and super heavies, since not only will you dispose of them quicker, you also get a hefty score boost that adds to your bragging rights of your mastery on the mode. The BFG is available, but using it will take away a big chunk of your score at the end, so if you're going for a high score, never use the BFG. Abstain yourself to better yourself, brosito. At the end of the mode, you get your score tallied. Your extra lives adds a lot to your score, so you must not die in the mode for you to be competitive. I love this mode. If I'm not feeling like playing the campaign or starting over and deleting a save file, I just play some horde mode and get my fix in a 20-30 minute session. The addition was something that fans have been asking for since weeks after the game launched. If you watch some of the gameplay trailers, there was supposed to be a mode called Invasion, in which enemy player demons would enter your campaign and try to kill you. This evolved into the Empowered Demons mechanic, which also originally implemented a multiplayer mechanic showing you the player who died to that demon. And the more players that demon killed, the stronger and faster it became. Now it's just a special enemy that randomly spawns during some encounters, but whatever. 
I don't like tacked on multiplayer in games, especially when it messes with the single player. So I'm glad that the devs changed the entire idea of Invasion and just went on and created the Horde mode, showing all the fans of the game that they were being listened to. I love Ed. They are the only saving grace in Bethesda. Thanks for this mode, guys. Finally! No, really, finally. There's the master levels. The master levels are remixes of levels that are already found in the campaign. Currently, there's a cultist base, super gore nest, art complex, Mars core, and Terra's Nevada. And for the second DLC, there's the world spear. I won't spoil these levels. If there's people who want it, I may do a review walkthrough on each individual master levels, since they represent both the best and the worst of Doom Eternal's design. The Taras Nabat master level can go fuck itself, is what I'm trying to say. There are some exclusive cosmetics linked to the completion of certain challenges in certain master levels, like completing an Ultra Nightmare or Extra Life run. During the gameplay discussion, I forgot to mention the Extra Life mode in which the extra lives are implemented into a pseudo ultra nightmare run, in which if you run out of lives and die, permadeath kicks in and your save file is deleted. This is a great way to gauge your knowledge on the game. If you finish the game with more than four lives, then with a little practice, you can start trying to challenge ultra nightmare. If you want to run ultra nightmare legitimately, you will change as a person. Be warned. Well, this is the end of my first video. If you've arrived here and watched the whole video, first, I can thank you enough. It means the world to me that someone would take the time to watch whatever I made. Second, even if you don't like Doom as a whole, or Eternal as a game, I hope this serves as an explanation to anyone who just can't get into the game. It's been a wild ride. This took weeks, near months of my time to create. I hope that you guys, had as much fun watching this video as I had making it. This is my first time writing anything related to games and putting it through a massive medium such as YouTube. I hope that this is the start of something grand. I'm totally committed to making this channel work and the only thing I need is for anyone, literally anyone, to listen to what I have to say. If you stuck around to the end of the video, there are just no words to describe how grateful I am to you for listening to me ramble for hours about a video game. I'm very passionate about video games and YouTube, though I never really had the time nor the tools to make it work. Now everything seems to be perfect for me to start this. I thought about posting the video after finishing the art through gameplay section of the video. I decided that it'd be half-assed of me and any continuity would be lost if I cut the video in that manner. So I grabbed my balls and said, I'm going full Geno Samuel on this. I couldn't be more proud of the end product. It was about six weeks of work in total. I took some days off from working all day on this, but I think this was a project, especially for a first project, that was overwhelming in size. But hey, if I beat Doom Eternal on Ultra Nightmare, this was like taking candy from a baby. There's some inconsistency with my editing style through the video, and I'm sorry about that. I'm still getting the hang of it, and hope to get it down by the next video. If anything, any commentary on what you'd like to see more or less of would be greatly appreciated. Some of you sound nuts out there might have noticed changes in the audio of my recording. More specifically, the quality was all over the place during the beginning hour of the video. This is because I changed my mic and setup mid-production and was too lazy and really felt no need to change what had already been done, since my editing style doesn't work well with last minute additions or additions. I'm sure as time goes on and I have more videos under my belt, this will be less of an issue but I'm sorry if you felt the quality was off in any way. You can be sure I'll be working on it. If you like the video, you know all the things the almighty Eldritch algorithm likes. It will help immensely and the only thing that I'd like is for people to watch this video and enjoy the content I'm planning on producing. I already opened a buy me a coffee. I know it looks bad doing this before even publishing my first video, but I guess it's just what every YouTuber does these days. And if you feel I deserve a little more than your subscription and your like, then it'll be greatly appreciated. And I'll be sure to reward those who support in that manner in some special and personalized way. You can reach me on Twitter. 
I don't know if YouTube allows any kind of communication like Gmail or something with creators, but if there is, feel free to contact me, though I'm not sure how all this works as of yet, so be patient, please, or use another method of communication, like smoke signals or a telegram, I don't know. I'll be sure to read each and every last comment you post on my video and respond to every comment, be it positive or negative, I really don't care. Even if you disliked the video and totally disagreed with everything I said and think I'm a bigoted douchebag, then please let me know in the comments and dislike the video. Engagement, reach and criticism will help me grow in this platform and again, I really don't care. <laughs> I just want to learn what you guys think of Doom Eternal and thought of this analysis. I want to send a special thank you to your favorite son who gave me a lot of feedback and read all my DMs on Twitter. You are really a great dude, man. Your videos are awesome and you have a style that I admire a lot. Thank you for putting up with my insecurities during the making of this video. I tend to seek approval from people I admire and this is why I bothered you so much. Solo te puedo decir gracias bro Tendo. Okay guys, I'm actually getting chills on my spine with the excitement I feel of finally finishing and publishing this video for you all. Eternal is the greatest game ever. It may not be the greatest piece of art, but in the end, all I have to say about Doom Eternal is that you need to experience it for yourself and give it a chance to grow on you. If only one of you guys felt interested in picking up the game, then the video's goal is a success. And if you already beat your Ultra Nightmare run, then you can accuse me of being a scrub in the comment section. I'll read it with a smile and a tear streaming down my cheek. Thank you guys, I'll be seeing you soon. I have no idea what the next review or analysis will be, but anything I do, you can be sure I'm going to be as passionate about it as I was about this. I will never work on anything that I know won't create something entertaining, so it's important for me to at least have something important to say about whatever I'm talking about. Have a good one, bro Tendos and bro Sidas.